Hi. Um, okay. So welcome again. I hope you enjoy your weekend. Um, so let me introduce to you Noah Smith that you, of course, know already. Um, you might not know that this school is 12 years old and Noah has been from the beginning there. And he looks exactly the same. So that's that's very good for him, not so good for me. Um, um, you probably know him as a professor at the University of Washington. He's also director of NLP research at AI2. He was professor at Carnegie Mellon, got his PhD from GHU and has nurtured so many good work, so many good students that I probably need to introduce that further. And we're very much looking forward to this new version of the slides, right, uh, for his, uh, for his uh, lecture. So please, thanks, speaker. All right, can you hear me okay? All right, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for having me back. Um, yeah, it's been, I can't believe how many years I got to give the same lecture. And I usually would start off by saying uh, the stuff I, I taught at the summer school up until this year never changed. Uh, the basic ideas went back to the 60s and we decided to update things a little bit. So the content I'm presenting uh, is similar to what I teach in uh, some of my classes at UW. Um, but uh, I'm not 100% sure I've got the timing right. Like after 12 years of giving the same lecture, it was perfect. Like I knew exactly like the coffee break. There was a slide for the coffee break and it always landed exactly at 1030. Everything was just, I don't know what's going to happen today. I think we'll make it to the end. A lot depends on how much you ask questions as we go. Um, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm an introverted American, so I love it when people ask questions during my lecture. If you're asking too many questions, don't worry. I'll stop you and we'll go on. Um, but uh, I was really excited. I was here the other night for, uh, for Sarah Hooker's talk, and uh, this is a very engaged audience, which I really like to see. So uh, please be encouraged to, to, if anything's not clear uh, or, or you want to ask questions, please go ahead. Um, the goal today is to talk about sequence models. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I think given, given the, the material Sarah presented, I, I think the beginning of this is going to feel very natural and it's already well motivated. The first motivation for modeling sequences is something like an autocomplete application. And yes, I did make this slide before ChatGPT. Um, suppose you're writing an email or you're writing a text message and the, the system now, it may be in gray text, it predicts your next word. Right, we all have this now uh, on in, in various applications that we use. It's it's become part of our lives. It's quite useful. Oh, nice. Next word, yeah. Um, so this is basically what we're what we're mainly going to talk about today. We we said sequence modeling. It's really we call it we call the task language modeling, and the language modeling task really boils down to predicting what the next word is given the preceding ones. Um, uh, you may hear me say the words on the left or something like that. Generally, I, as an English speaker and someone who writes uh, in English mostly, I tend to think of language going left to right on the page. If you write in a language that goes right to left, you can think in the other direction. But generally, we're going, we're going forward to the next word in time if we were speaking. Uh, the second motivation for modeling these kinds of sequences is actually, uh, historically, where, where uh, language models were born was in the field of speech recognition. Um, so if you want to if you want to do speech recognition, you want to take an audio signal in and convert it to a sequence of symbolic words, discrete words. Uh, then there are two things you have to do, right? You have to come up with a sequence of words that is faithful to what the sounds are, but that's also fluent. And so these two these two sort of sometimes competing goals were often formulated uh, in the following way: if the acoustics are a that's the input, and we're mapping to some word sequence W. We want to choose the best W, the W star, that maximizes both the faithfulness to the acoustics and also the fluency. And notice that the fluency is just a property of the words themselves. That's sort of independent. And this was, you know, this was a really important uh, decomposition of the speech recognition problem because you can get data to build a fluency model, what we call today a language model, that doesn't, it doesn't have to be paired with acoustics. It's just, it's just raw text. And this is over the period, over the history of speech recognition and natural language processing, we've had more and more text with which to estimate this, this fluency model or language model. Um, and there are many, many other tasks that had the same kind of decomposition. You want to translate text from one language to another. Having a fluency model for your output language 
is going to help you. You want to build a conversational system that speaks fluently. You want to summarize a document. So you want to be faithful to the content in the original document, but you also want your summary to be fluent or captioning an image or optical character recognition, spelling and grammar correction. Many, many problems had this, uh, this decomposition into some kind of faithfulness to the input, but also fluency. And so we would try to combine both criteria into uh, into one uh, one score and then and then search for a high scoring sequence. We're going to talk a little bit about this decomposition later. Um, mostly in the beginning, we're going to focus on the language model, which gives you a notion of fluency. Um, I, I like to mention one other reason to talk about language models, um, which is uh, maybe a little bit more of a stretch, but uh, but I think in the long run, this is this is a very useful uh, way to think. Uh, right now, I think the the scientific view of language and the language models that we're building, they feel pretty far apart from each other. Um, but one of the reasons some people like to study language models is that they give us a notion of surprise. So, you know, if you're if you're trying to compare two different theories about how language works, uh, call them A and B, and you can you can take the theory and look at some data and get a measure of surprise, how surprised would a person who believes this theory be by this data? then you probably prefer the, the theory that gives you lower surprise, all other things equal. Um, and so we're not, gonna, we're not gonna go very far down this path today, but I like to point out that language models can be used to give us a notion of surprise. They can score uh, data uh, under a given model. And if we, if, under certain conditions, if we can compare those scores, this could be a useful theoretical tool. All right, in order to do language models, we have to have a quick review of probability. I'm gonna go through this quickly. If it's confusing or anything I say doesn't sound right to you, speak up now because we're going to keep coming back to this. Uh, and this will also introduce some of my, my notational choices, uh, which are not too, uh, shouldn't be too unconventional. So the first thing, when you have a probability, you have to have an event space. We'll use script uh, for event spaces. So script X, script Y, for example. And in this lecture, uh, I believe everything will be discrete. Uh, we have random variables that range over values in those event spaces, and we'll use capital letters for those, like X and Y. And we have to be able to talk about random variables taking values. So we might say random variable big X takes value little x, which is an element of script X, the event space. And the way we would write it is the probability that big X equals little x. And sometimes we'll be a little bit more concise and just say little p of little x. But there's always an implied random variable here. Uh, often we need to talk about joint probabilities. So this is like, you should read this like an and. So this is the probability that big X takes that value of little X, big Y takes value little Y. Both of these things have to happen. A very, very important thing to remember uh, when dealing with language models is the difference between the joint probability and the conditional probability. So this is, this is read as the probability that X takes value little X given that y takes the value little y. So we we know we have some information. We know that uh, this random variable has already taken its value, and now we can talk about the distribution over values for x given that information. And the way this is defined, it's the ratio between the joint probability of the two uh, var variables taking their values divided by the marginal of the thing on the right. Uh, this is this is just the definition. This is how we. Uh, so this, there's nothing, no proof needed. It's just, you know, this this is notational shorthand for this ratio. And then, given that, we have you know some properties that are always true. We can always take a joint probability and decompose it into a product of uh, the conditional times the marginal. This is just rearranging terms from the definition up here, uh, and we can do it the other way. So you can always choose which order. To decompose in, and that's that's kind of useful. Uh, we'll make use of that a little bit later on. Um, and then finally, sometimes people get confused about this one. Uh, it is sometimes the case that the joint probability can be decomposed into a product of marginals. Pop quiz: What is this property called? Independence. So this is only true if the two events are independent of each other. Um, one thing that I think, you know, when people talk about probability, uh, they're often doing it in a very formal theoretical way. Um, and I think that there's this like gap that sometimes doesn't get bridged perfectly well. So it's, I think, incredibly important uh, when we talk about 
estimating probability distributions, which we'll be doing a lot today, to remember that there's, there's sort of like this assumption. When you go to estimate a probability distribution, you are adopting a sort of tentative assumption, belief, that, uh, that there's some true distribution that you're trying to approximate through this estimation procedure. So all of the Ps on here, they're sort of like, I haven't really said. Are, they, are these probabilities that are being calculated by some neural network or some other function, or are they probabilities that exist out there in the universe? I'm being very vague on this slide. Um, whenever we talk about probabilities uh, in this lecture, if you're not clear whether I'm talking about the true probability or an estimated one, uh, then call me out and say, wait, is this true? Is this, is this an estimated value? Um, I think this, this importance is really different. Is, is really this difference is really important uh, because um language models are always uh they're you know they're always derived from data the true language model uh if it exists is something we can never actually see it's not something we can observe um so it's you know it's sort of a weird thing to talk about the true probability uh, uh, distribution over the next word um and i think you know if we if we're honest with ourselves we we may even reject the idea that such a, a distribution really in general exists Okay, let's let's get a little closer to natural language. Um, so our, our the event space we're going to be mostly concerned with at first is script V, which is going to be uh, a set of discrete symbols. Usually we say words, um, but sometimes people build language models over characters. And today, the state the state of the art language models are usually built over some combination of the two. Uh, so so we'll come back to this point, but. Um, you know, what exactly is a word? If you speak a language like Chinese, it's not totally trivial to decide how you're going to chop up a long sequence of text into, in, into words because Chinese is written without white space. If you speak a language like English, it may be very clear that you can separate things on white space, but sometimes you're tempted to split even when there isn't white space. Like maybe the period at the end of a sentence or the comma in the middle of a sentence should be split off as, a, as its own token. These, these decisions are, are pretty important to deciding what your vocabulary space is. Um, but in general, we, we call it V because we, it's, it's known as the vocabulary, and we'll use a large V when we need to talk about the size of the vocabulary. Okay, now language modeling isn't just distributions over words and vocabulary, it's distributions over sequences uh, of symbols from that vocabulary. So V star following theory of computation is gonna be the infinite set of all sequences of symbols from V. Okay, very, very large set of things here. And this is actually the event space for a language model, the set of all sequences. And the way we're going to imagine this is there's a sequence of random variables, x1, x2, and so on, all the way up to some xn. And n is sort of arbitrary, and n could be any value. n is the first time that the model generates this stop symbol. So this is supposed to be a stop sign. Okay, so you keep generating until this special end of sequence symbol is produced. And that is when uh, the, the process stops and you have your sequence. Um, so to be, to be extra precise, we're going to use V dagger to mean the infinite set of sequences of, of symbols from V with a single stop symbol at the end. So this is really the event space of language models because we always generate just until we get that first stop symbol. Does it make sense? All right, so here is the language modeling problem. And I'm simplifying very slightly. We'll talk about this. The input is training data, uh, bold symbol X. It's a little X because it's values of random variables and it's bold because it's a sequence. It's a sequence of N words or characters, elements of V, uh, and, uh, and it's in V dagger. So that you, know, you know that XN is gonna be a stop symbol, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna talk about that too much. Sometimes it's useful to think of having the training data be a collection of observations, each one in V dagger, but that will complicate my notation. So for today, just for now, think of the training data as being one sequence. The output of building your language model is going to be a distribution P that take it, given a, a V dagger, an element of V dagger, maps it to a real value. Okay, so it's a score. Think of it as a measure of plausibility. How much like language does this look? All right, so that's what language modeling is. We'll say a lot more about it as we go. 
Um, whenever I introduce, uh, and, and we've, we motivated it, right? You understand why we would want to build a language model. You, I've hopefully convinced you that we could use it in an autocomplete system, or we could plug it into a speech recognizer to help us get better outputs or a machine translation system. Um, whenever we introduce a task in NLP, whenever you hear somebody talk about a problem they want to solve uh, using, using uh, machine learning, one of the first questions you should ask is, how will we know whether we succeeded? What is the evaluation? And um, if you talk to people, researchers today working in NLP, you'll often find uh, a sense of frustration over how things are evaluated. Um, so the first thing we're gonna talk about is evaluation of language models. Then we'll talk about how we build them and how we use them. Okay, so we're gonna drill down, let's drill down one more level. Um, as I, because I named this, uh, this score, the plausibility score P, you should have a sense, you know, I kind of primed you to think that this was going to be a probability distribution, and it is. So when we say that P is a probability distribution, we have some extra constraints on the values it can assign. The first one is uh, that for any sequence in V dagger, the probability of that sequence has to be greater than or equal to zero. We can't have negative probabilities. And the second one is that if we summed up the probabilities over every possible sequence, and there's infinitely many of them, they have to sum to one. Otherwise, it's not a probability distribution. Okay, this is this is sort of how language models uh, work by by design. They they have this property, um, and this you know why do we do it this way? Well, there's two. I think there's two reasons why uh, people gravitate towards probability when they build language models. Um, the first one is uh, people find probability kind of interpretable, right? If I have uh, if I have probabilistic scores. Uh, it, it, it makes sense to do things like compare the probabilities of two sequences. If I want to choose the more fluent of, of multiple options, it's very easy to do. Uh, people also uh, kind of like this sort of marginalizing property. So I can sum up probabilities over a set of maybe similar sequences if I'm looking for an answer uh, from a question answering system. And I, have and I know that there are multiple ways of saying yes. I can, I can add up the probabilities and compare them to, to the uh, sum of probabilities of different ways of saying no, and I can get maybe a better answer. Um, I think the other big reason that people like probability in, in the world of language modeling is that we, we have this really nice thing called the maximum likelihood principle. Who knows the maximum likelihood principle? Okay, some people have seen it. We'll come back to it. Um, this is sort of like you know the first step towards building a language model from data is to apply the maximum likelihood principle. And we, we often, you know, in, in, in historically, we don't always completely follow it. And we often have good reasons for deviating it. But it's like the natural starting point. And, uh, and it gets you like 90% of the way there. Uh, if you understand maximum likelihood, then, then you, don't have to, you don't have to rebuild everything from scratch every time you change your language model. OK, so let's talk about that a little bit. Um, the maximum likelihood principle says, if, you're, <laughs> if your observations, your data are x, and you have a set of distri probability distributions consistent with whatever assumptions you want to make about the data, call that, that set of distributions script P, the distribution you should choose is the one that maximizes the probability of the data. Okay, so we're going in circles. We're, we, we, we said probability was a great way uh, to, uh, we motivated, we motivated uh, language models all these different ways. We said probability gives you this interpretable thing. Uh, I think my fourth motivation was if I have multiple theories and I want to compare them, I can use probability scores to compare different theories. You can think of the maximum likelihood principle as applying that same kind of thinking. I have script P, a large set of possible probability distributions that are all consistent with my assumptions. I'm going to choose the one that makes my data most likely. Not super controversial. Um, so in practice, what this means is that P is, is what we call a family of probabilistic models uh, that are defined by a set of parameters. So these are, these are like, I, I, I like this metaphor of thinking of like a black box, right? Um, and it, it assigns probabilities to different sequences. Um, and on the box are a whole bunch of little dials and knobs. Lots of them, maybe billions of them later in the lecture tomorrow. But for now, just picture, you know, a manageable number of knobs. And what I'm doing when I'm choosing the, what I'm, when I turn the knobs, it changes the distribution somehow. And so, but, but, but no matter how I set the knobs, I've still got the same black box. That's the family. And the parameter settings, the different knobs that I'm turning 
uh, are basically changing the, the behavior of that distribution. So sometimes we'll, we'll write, we'll, we'll put a little semicolon to, to indicate that the, the distribution has some parameters. The maximum likelihood estimate uh, uh, of the parameters is the one that maximizes the likelihood. So we've, we've gone from a, a problem that's sort of vague and, and, uh, and imprecise over the, you know, what is script P? It's this family of distributions down to a numerical problem. Right now we're searching for, for uh, continuous values theta of these different parameters. Um, and you know, maximum likelihood estimation was not designed for language models. It's a general principle. If you learned it in a class, you probably learned it for something like weighted coins, right? So let's, let's step aside from language for a minute and review this. If I have a sequence of coin flips drawn from heads and tails, at least one, Right and uh, and and there, uh, sorry, there are n of them. I keep clicking this like it's a clicker, and it's not. Um, so the assumption here, or we have to be clear about our assumptions when we estimate probability distributions. Let's assume that uh, it's the same coin that's been flipped repeatedly, and nobody has changed the coin in between my flips. Right? It doesn't. It's not like it's picking up extra mass or its its dimensions are changing. It's literally the same coin, which means the observations are independent and identically distributed to each other. So the prob there's some probability that the coin will come up heads, call that theta. And the maximum likelihood estimate tells us, okay, lots of math, but basically it's saying, choose the value of theta that's going to make the observations I've seen as likely as possible. Okay, so let's walk through it. Um, here we have, we multiply in a theta every time we see a head. So for every xi that took the value h, we multiply in a theta. For every uh, xi that took in a value t, we multiply in one minus theta. If we multiply all of those thetas and one minus thetas together, then we have the total probability of our sequence of coin flips as a function of theta. Now that function of theta is what we want to maximize under the constraint that theta is between zero and one, because you can't have a probability of heads less than zero or greater than one. And I'm not going to do the derivation. It requires a little bit of uh, you know, Lagrangian multiplier and stuff like that to deal with this constraint. But basically what comes out is that you should set the, the fact that the, the maximum likelihood estimate of theta will be proportional to the number of times you saw heads. And you divide it by the total number of, uh, uh, of flips that you saw. This basic, basic, basic principle gives you a closed form solution that most people find very intuitive. Right, you probably you, know, you probably had this intuition that if I were if I tossed a coin and nine times out of ten it came up heads, you think it's probably weighted, probably something like 0.9. That intuition is basically what it, it really can be can be uh, given can be grounded in, in in kind of a mathematical argument using the maximum likelihood principle. Um, and so you know for for probabilistic models that are based on like discrete events then uh, generally the MLE equates to counting things and normalizing them. And, you know, very, very intuitive, uh, not, super, uh, not super difficult. And, you know, I like to point out that for a long time, um, language models and really a lot of things in NLP were done this way. Uh, you, you defined a probabilistic model, you defined uh, some assumptions, um, things like, you know, it's the same coin being flipped repeatedly. Uh, and then and then you counted the right things and you followed the equations and you normalized and you didn't have to do any kind of iterative things. You didn't need GPUs. Uh, life was much, much simpler. Um, once you figured out, so, so all the work went into figuring out the assumptions in the model. And then the, the, the hard computational work was really just counting stuff and things were, were, were just easy, very, very different from now. Um, okay, so I'm sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting off topic. The, 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 the thing I wanted to get to here was how we evaluate language models. But I had to talk a little bit, a little bit about probability because the, the sort of starting point for evaluating language models is heavily grounded in the fact that they are probabilistic. They assign distributions to observations of data. So here's the, here's the key insight. Uh, among language models, we wanna choose the one that is, we, we would prefer one that is less surprised. So uh, if Bruno builds a language model and Fernando builds a language model, and we've agreed on some game rules. Uh, whoever gets the, the, the whoever builds the model that is least surprised by some data, um, some new data, uh, is the is going to be the winner. Um, all right. So this is very important. Why do I say new data? I've, 
you want to generalize. You want you want a model that uh, that performs well on what we call the test data set. And this is, I think this is, I call this the cardinal rule of machine learning, that you should never, ever, ever use the test data for anything except the final test. Okay, it's like, uh, imagine, I, I think LXMLS doesn't have exams, does it? But suppose we did. All right, now suppose we had an exam and on, on the last day, I don't know, Friday, whatever day is the last day, uh, you have to take an exam. If we discovered that someone had um, uh, had somehow gotten a copy of the exam before the exam time, we wouldn't trust their and, and the solutions, even just the exam, honestly, you know, because then uh, then we wouldn't be able to trust their score. Right. Like it wouldn't be meaningful because even if they were honest and they didn't know, even if they didn't actually look up the answers, we just have no way of verifying that they really earned the score that they earned. Right, it just invalidates the test. It gives us the test no longer gives us any information. So this is really important. If if the language model has already seen the test data in some form, in some way, um, then what follows is just not a meaningful test at all. Okay, and so we you know actually one of the worries to bring this to to modern times. Um, one of the worries about some of the language models that people are reporting things on today is that they are being tested, maybe not using the method I'm going to show you, but using, using you know, standard testing me methods that, that rely on test data that's supposed to be fresh, clean, never seen by the language model. We don't know what these models were trained on. And so we don't know if they've already seen the test, which makes it very hard to know whether we should rely on the results. OK, so here's, but here's the very basic standard intrinsic evaluation. And I'm going to give it to you in three steps. First. You use your language model to score the test data with its parameters, okay? Note that I'm using X bar for test data. Now, here's the thing. The probability distributions we're talking about, they give very, very, very tiny scores, especially to long sequences. Remember that we have a total probability, it's like a pi. We have a pi of one, and we have to divide it up over infinitely many sequences. And so if you have a nice test set of, I don't know, a million words, uh, it's going to have a very small probability. So, in fact, what we what we do is we we transform uh, the probability in in this kind of interesting way, um, which people often you know they, they they look at it and they're like, why would you do this? This is this looks crazy, but there's a certain beauty to it. I'm not going to go into the theory. You take the probability of the test data, you take its inverse, all right, and then you take the root. At the uh, 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 the the nth root, so n our n bar here is the size of the data uh, of the test data in words. So what you're what you're basically doing is you're taking like a geom it's 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 a geometric average of the per word inverse probability. And and so I know it, it sounds crazy. I, writing it this way is most beautiful. This is actually more like how we calculate it. We really take the log probability. Which is much easier to work with. It doesn't. It's not going to have the underflow problems you'll have with the, these tiny numbers. Uh, and then you uh, you scale it by the size of the data, and then you exponentiate. It's the same thing. These these equations uh, give you the same result. This is typically how it's actually calculated. Um, the insight you should have here is that perplexity is it's it's entirely derived from the probability and the size of the data. Um, the special cases put it in perspective. Suppose you had a really good model. Fernando is just really good at building language models. He's so good. His language model gave probability one to the test data. Seems impossible. It is impossible if you do it right. But you know, suppose he was that good. Um, then perplexity would be one, right? Because because essentially it should be clear one over one is one, and any root of one is one. One. Very happy. That's the best perplexity you can ever get. Is one. Um, if, uh, sorry, I'll have to pick on somebody. Diksha built a terrible language model and, uh, and he gave zero probability to the test data. Zero, complete failure. Uh, perplexity would be infinite because one over zero goes to infinity. Okay, infinitely perplexed. If I ever write an academic satire novel, I will call it infinitely perplexed. Um, Okay, so it's important. So this actually leads to something really important. If you're going to use perplexity to measure the quality of your language model, which, which many people still do, um, then it's really critical that you make sure that your probability P 
always give strictly positive probability to every sequence of words in your vocabulary. That's actually kind of tricky sometimes. It turns out for today's models, it's not a problem. It's quite easy. But there was a phase of language model history where this, this particular rule made things complicated. And you'll see why later. Okay, so um, if you want to interpret, so, so basically smaller is better. One is the best you can do. There's no bound. It can be infinitely bad. Um, and so basically the name of the game is lower perplexity is better. And you can think if you want an, a, a way to interpret it, I, it's a little hard to give the full intuition here, but you can kind of think about it as your language model is trying over and over again to guess the next word. Then the perplexity is essentially like a branching factor or the effective vocabulary size, given the distribution that you have of your average guess in the test data. So if your language model is really good and really predicts the test data well, it's effectively, it effectively knows and the perplexity will be close to one. It's like you're, you always kind of know among a very small number of words what the next one will be. If the perplexity is very large, that means your model really has no idea and it's guessing among a very large portion of the vocabulary at every step. It's a quantitative way of, of capturing uncertainty or surprise. Okay, a couple rules about perplexity, and these are things to watch out for. Um, the first one is uh, you can't use it unless the models use the same vocabulary. Okay, if, uh, if, if my language model uses a, a character, is character level, and uh, Fernando's is... Um, is word level, they're just, the perplexity scores won't be, they won't be in the same space, they won't be comparable. Um, second, uh, if you look at research papers where people work on language modeling, they often report perplexity on conventionally accepted test sets. And these numbers, you know, we used to have like a range, when I was a student, I remember people talking about perplexities in the hundreds. Now the numbers are like, I don't know, you see numbers like 16, it's crazy. Um, it, I'm not going to get into the numbers, okay? Uh, it, it really depends on your vocabulary. It's, it's, it's not comparable across all models because they don't use the same vocabularies. And I really don't want to, I think getting into, getting into the numbers and thinking of this as like, you know, the leaderboard, the mother of all leaderboards is the perplexity leaderboard where the goal is to get perplexity as close to one as we can. I, I, I don't think that's quite right, right? It really is only an intermediate measure of performance. Ultimately, if you're building real systems, you want to evaluate them with real people. And the, the ultimate measure of performance should be whether the system is doing what people want it to do. If you believe next word prediction is the goal, then, uh, then something like perplexity might be reasonable. Um, but I, you know, my take for the summer school and for, for, for people who are students and researchers is that understanding the models is way more important than remembering specific perplexity numbers or specific trained test sets and so on. Um, your data, the data you want to apply the model to or the setting where you want to deploy the model is always different from the evaluation benchmark. Um, so I don't know. I think, I think the, the, numbers, the numbers don't really tell that much of the story. So I don't, I don't fixate on them that much. Um, okay, so uh, perplexity, as I pointed out, was, uh, is a measure on test data. Uh, you, you plug in the test data, you get out this number, you have a way to interpret it, you have a way to compare models. But you could also calculate the perplexity on the training data. Okay, we wouldn't, we wouldn't use that to compare models. It's, it's not particularly interesting. This is cheating, right? Um, but here's a question. If I compute the training data perplexity, how do I think it will compare? How do you think it will compare with the test data perplexity? Somebody says it should be higher. Training data should be higher. Somebody says training data perplexity should be lower. Can somebody give me an intuition about one of these? You, we already saw it. Okay. Now, um, you know, one way to think about language models, uh, I think I, I think I'll come back to this. Um, there's this like one version of language models that that that's kind of a an interesting straw man version of language models is a really good model that has the capacity to memorize the data, right? If, if you can memorize the training data, um, then you should be able to predict it really well when you see it at test time, right? You should be completely unsurprised. So generally speaking, we don't, you know, nobody cares that much about training data perplexity as a, it's not a measure of performance, but we would generally expect it would be much lower than the test data. 
So you know, one one thing that um, this is this is a good check to do, right? Have I learned? Uh, if if my perplexity on the training data is low, that's a sign that I have learned something, right? Um, uh, yeah. So so I don't know. Just a kind of an interesting point. Um, you know, yeah. And you can you can extrapolate this out a little farther. Um, suppose I have multiple test sets, uh, and suppose I trained my model on I don't know. Um, news, news, news stories from the 1980s. I don't know. And then uh, I have three test sets. One of them is news from the 1990s. Uh, one of them is uh, Twitter. And one of them is, um, uh, I don't know, um, government documents about the moon landing. Which one do you think will have the lowest test set perplexity? News, right? You expect the model to generalize better to data that looks more like the training data. And you would expect the perplexity to be worse and the generalization performance to be worse on, uh, on things like moon landing uh, memoranda. OK, um, another point I like to make, because I like pointing out the problems with everything we do as we go, um, this idea that there's a finite vocabulary this is uh, very useful for machine learning. It's very useful for the engineering of a uh, task of building a language model. It's, it's actually essential uh, for that. Uh, things get really, really complicated if you don't have a finite vocabulary. But the fact is, language doesn't work like that, right? In your lifetime, I am sure that there have been new words coined that weren't in the vocabulary that you learned as a small child and you had to learn. Can you give me an example? COVID. COVID was not a word in our vocabulary in 2018, right? Now it is a word in our vocabulary. We all know it. We use it all the time. Um, many others, I don't know, for me, the word friend used to be a noun. And then it became a verb. And then there was unfriend. Like as a child, I would not have known what unfriend meant. Um, okay, so, you know, and here's this. I like this example. We, we, at one point, people in my group were doing a lot of work with social media text. And we ran uh, a clustering algorithm on all the words that we observed in social media and, uh, and quickly found, you know, clustering algorithms based on con contextual word cues tend to put together variations on the same word that are just sort of spelled differently or, you know, capitalization or using a, a, simil a visually similar digit to substitute for a letter or using, I, don't, I think this is like a special Unicode character for number. And people use it for no, and then they put, you know, slashes and other punctuation. It's, there's sort of like infinite variations, even on very familiar everyday words when people write. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is annoying. Um, and uh, it, it, I think it's often been a source of frustration for people who want to deal with natural language as it really occurs in the world, that they have to make this simplifying assumption. Um, so I want to talk just a little bit about, about how we deal with this. Um, so in the old days, the way we handled uh, the, the vocabulary problem was to define what was in the vocabulary and then have a special symbol uh, called out of vocabulary or unknown. Sometimes it was called unk. And the idea is that uh, once you decided which words were in the vocabulary, everything else, usually rare words in the training data, were mapped to unk. And it was important to do this with the training data and have some unk words in the training data so that at test time, when you saw an unknown word, you could just treat it as this unk symbol. Okay, this is very unsatisfying. You're basically throwing everything you've never seen before and saying it's all effectively the same symbol. Okay, not 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 great, but you know, for research, it was it was reasonable and it was very widely done, um, and it was very important that we all agree on how to transform words to unk or not, uh, and that we all had the same vocabulary. Why? Because perplexity, right? We wanted to be able to compare language models. Um, another solution people have proposed, and this idea comes back every few years. You can find it in the literature. Uh, is just set your vocabulary to be the characters, like, like the Unicode characters or all the characters that are used in the language you're working in, um, and, uh, or bytes even, uh, and just build your language model at that level so you'll never see an unknown character. Okay, That's, that's not crazy, but it does, it does lead to a rather computationally expensive approach because there are uh, going to be, the sequences are going to be very long, uh, the character, the character set. If you take all of Unicode, I think it's pretty big, um, and it's sort of ignoring, you know, higher level things in language. Like, like people who study language are pretty. They like the idea of words, 
right? Like if you want to make theoretical assumptions about language, starting from the idea that there are words, not a super controversial assumption, generally considered useful. Okay, so what do we do today? Today we have, we have we've kind of settled on a, a sort of middle ground. Um, so we have these, these data-driven deterministic tokenization schemes. So you take your training corpus or a large corpus and you basically do this pre-processing. I, I don't remember how much I'm gonna say about it. I think I come back to this a little later. You segment, uh, you segment words into uh, smaller parts so that you reduce the effective vocabulary size and you find a trade-off that makes you happy. You decide how much, how big do I want the vocabulary to be? Uh, basically all the characters uh, are, are gonna be in the vocabulary at least at the starting point. And then I'm gonna add in you know, longer and longer strings that seem to be relatively frequent so that often I'm predicting longer units um, but, uh, but in general, if I see any sequence of characters, I can tokenize it somehow and treat it as a sequence of, of, uh, of, of symbols. Um, okay, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna talk too much more about that. It's, a, it's an interesting topic. It's one of the, one of the places where uh, people who have linguistic intuitions or have studied linguistics, do we have any linguists? Excellent, okay. So tokenization is usually a topic that makes linguists angry and that um, spiteful engineers can use to make linguists angry. If you're a linguist, I would suggest don't get angry at the tokenization schemes. They're, they're never going to make you happy. Uh, they don't usually take into account things like the morphological system of the language or interesting orthographic properties. They could in principle, sometimes people try. Uh, generally today, they're just purely data-driven and you just have to swallow it, sorry. Okay, so we're gonna assume we have this fixed finite vocabulary V. Training starts from the maximum likelihood principle. The training data will be X1 through Xn, and we will evaluate perplexity on the text, test data X bar one through X bar N bar. That's the game. Okay, now I've done all of this in a very careful way to talk about the, the rules of the game without talking about how we solve the problem. Okay, this is a very useful thing uh, to be able to do when you're when you're working in machine learning in general, separate the evaluation, the data, uh, the rules of the game, all your assumptions, separate all of that as much as you can from your solution. You'll be a happier person. The thinking you do up front will last a lot longer. None of what I've shown you has changed in my lifetime. All right, and I don't expect, you know, that there are, there's more to say about evaluation of language models. I haven't given you 100% of the story, but I don't expect anything I've set up to this point to dramatically change for some time to come. Okay, what, so think about what doesn't change, and then that's probably going to be different because the second part of this lecture is a roller coaster of changes in models and techniques over time. All right, so here's our first language model. Remember, Remember that bold X is our training data. It's a training sequence, all right? Um, so this is, here's a dead simple language model where I say the probability of, uh, of a sequence X is proportional to the number of times I've seen it. All right, now if I only have one training sequence, this means that my count for that sequence is one. That sequence gets probability one. If I have multiple sequences in my training set, then uh, say, say I have uh, K of them, then you know, any sequence I saw in training is gonna have a count of, uh, of one. And so the, the, the probability will end up being like one over K, or if I saw it twice, it would be two over K. Um, what do you think? Bad. People already don't like it. So simple, so simple, um, but not great. Um, what if your test data wasn't in the, wasn't in the training data? What, what's my perplexity? Infinite perplexity. This is a complete failure. This is, I call this, um, in, in an earlier version, I think, I, I think when I taught this here in the past, uh, I had like some illustrative examples. I call this the creepy language model, right? All it does is it, it, it remembers things it's seen before and it repeats them back verbatim. It can't do anything else, okay? Um, so this is like not really what we're going to do. Um, the issue remains, even if we have multiple sequences in the training data, even if we have a lot of them, because people will always say things nobody said before. You will always see new sequences. Okay, memorizing the training data, probably not, not going to get you what you want. So we don't do that. Okay, so that was, that was like the straw man starting point. 
it applied the maximum like maximum likelihood principle. But the problem I would say with that approach is that it it really made no assumptions at all. It didn't it didn't uh, you know it, it, whoever whoever invented that model. Um, I, I I don't know who invented it because it's just you know it's not really a model anybody would use. Um, they didn't they didn't think deeply about like the nature of the sequences right that model didn't even care that we were modeling sequences. So so the thing that actually people do is they start you know from um, the chain rule. So this is sort of a a, a broadened out version of one of those uh, nice little equations I gave you back at the beginning about conditional probability, but generalized out to sequences of length n. So what we have here is the probability of, uh, of a sequence, right, of a sequence random variable, big X, big bold X, taking a sequential value, and we're decomposing it into a product where things happen along the sequence. The first random variable takes its value with some marginal probability, P X1 takes value little X1 up here. And then the second one takes its value conditioned on the first. And then the third one takes its value condition on the first two. So this is my notation for the subsequence of X from one to two. And this continues along the sequence. Again, I'm thinking left to right as an English speaker. If we have Arabic or Hebrew speakers, they might be going right to left. Um, up until the end where the last symbol, which is always the stop symbol, is generated conditioned on X one through N minus one. We wanted to write it in a more elegant way. We would write it as this product here. Uh, from I, I going from one to N. And so this is, this is a little different, right? Now we've taken this problem of assigning scores to whole sequences and decomposed it into next word prediction, right? That's the, that's the connection. If you were wondering, how do we get to next word prediction? Uh, it's, this, it's this particular step that gets us there. Um, notice that we, we didn't have to do it left to right. We could have ordered the random variables in any way we wanted. We could have a language model that first generates the even indexed words and then goes back and generates the odd indexed ones. Why not, right? I don't know why you would do it, but if you thought, if you had some weird theory of language that said even and odd positions are somehow different, okay. I don't think anybody thinks that. Check with a linguist. Um, but this is, the other thing I love about this is that it makes very clear that your job in making this prediction over this one next word over this very manageable V-sized vocabulary space, it hinges on what information you encode or summarize about the history. And so the whole game of language modeling really comes down to how do I encode what I need from the history to make this prediction well? All right, so here's your first real legit language model people actually used for stuff in the history of NLP and machine learning. It's called the Unicram model. Who's heard of it? Okay, but you're still here, you're not sleeping. So uh, it never hurts to see it again, it never hurts to see it in new notation. The Unigram model says, uh, so this first line, I wanna, be, I wanna be clear, right? This first line, this is what I had on the last slide. This is not making any assumptions at all. This is just like the definition of joint probabilities, the definition of conditional probabilities. You can always apply the chain rule. You can always choose any order. We, we chose for, for, for reasons that feel intuitive to order the random variables from left to right, but we always condition on everything that came before. And so we've not made any assumptions. When you start reducing the set of things you condition on or encoding them somehow or taking information away, then you're starting to make assumptions. And so the, the Unigram model makes the strongest assumption of all. It says, none of that matters. Just cross it out, ignore it. The word that we generate next does not depend on the history. It is simply drawn from this fixed distribution over the vocabulary. Okay, so, so now we, we're gonna use a, a, a parameter vector theta to assign a, a, a word probability, a Unigram probability to every word in the vocabulary. The product of the whole sequence is simply the product of the probabilities of each of the tokens in the sequence. So theta xi is the, the probability value of the ith word in the sequence. Physical metaphor. I have a very large die, like you use when you play games at a casino. Instead of six sides, it has v sides. It has to be large because those sides are, you know, they have to have a word written on them. To generate language, I roll the die, and I look at the word that came up on top and I write it down. And I keep rolling the die until the stop symbol comes up on top. 
I could not find a picture of this on the internet. It only just now occurred to me that I could use generative AI to generate a picture of this die. If you, if you get bored and you want to generate this picture for me and email it to me, I will be appreciative. Um, the maximum likelihood estimate for this model is also dead simple. Okay, for every word in the vocabulary, the probability of that word, the, the maximum likelihood estimate for the probability of that word is proportional to the, the number of words in the data that are that word, the number of tokens that take that type V. So we just count and then we divide by the size of the data. That's it. No gradient descent, no initialization, no dropout, no nothing. Okay, so simple, so simple, so easy, so small. The number of parameters you have is simply the size of the vocabulary. Okay, what can you do with this model? Not very much. All right, it's not, you're not going to use it to generate text. You're probably not going to use it for autocomplete. It's a good baseline, right? If you, if you build something fancy and it doesn't get better perplexity than this, you know something's odd. Um, but there it is, that's the, that's the Unigram model. Uh, so work through a little example. We have a sentence like presidents tell lies. Notice my tokenization splits off the period so that lies is its own word and, and period comes separate. The probability of this is the, the product of the probabilities of each one include the stop probability. In unigram notation, it's theta presidents times theta tell, theta lies, theta dot, theta stop. Maximum likelihood estimate would give you, uh, this would be the formula to calculate that probability. That's it. Okay, um, I, like to, I like to take, you know, the dead simplest thing you can do and make it even simpler. Imagine I was lazy and I didn't even want to deal with training data. I just said, all right, I've chosen the vocabulary. I'm now going to make a language model, a unigram model that is um, as, uh, as simple as it can be. I'm not even going to look at the data. I'm just going to evenly weight that die. Every word in the vocabulary gets one over V probability. What's the perplexity of this model? Big V, the perplexity is the vocabulary size. So this is sort of like the worst perplexity you should ever see is the vocabulary size. I, I, just a reminder, I said you could think of uh, perplexity as the branching factor. It's the average number of choices the model is making at every step under its assumptions, under its probability distribution. This model, this uniform unigram model, is always to it, it always says all words are equally likely it's always choosing among the v choices if you go and build something fancy and complicated and expensive and you end up with a perplexity higher than v your boss should fire you you have failed all right you 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 should always expect a language model or if you read a paper and they give you a perplexity value that's larger than the vocabulary size something went wrong notice that it doesn't even depend on the test data right just like the, per, the, the, the choice of the values didn't depend on the training data. The, the evaluation doesn't even depend on the test data. As long as it's restricted to words in V. Okay, so let's take stock. Unigram models, easy to understand, very cheap to build. Um, one, one place where they did find purchase was, uh, was in uh, some information retrieval models. Um, weighting, weighting words by, uh, by their frequency turns out to be a, a useful trick in, in older versions of information retrieval. Um, but some of the things we don't love about them, one, there's this fixed known vocabulary assumption. We talked about that a bit. I'll continue to complain about that throughout the lecture without giving you a better solution. Um, but this, this idea, well, sometimes people talk about unigram models and call them bags of words. Uh, because essentially what you're, do what you're doing is you're saying that the text, uh, really, it's, you know, the probability of, uh, uh, of a new piece of text is equivalent to the probability of iteratively drawing each of the words out of a bag that contains the training data words. Um, there's no, uh, you know, the relative frequency stuff kind of makes sense, but there's no interdependence between the words at all. So the probability of a sequence of very high probability words like the over and over again is always going to be higher than the probability of well-formed English sentences that use different words, each of which is low probability, right? The structure of language, the interdependencies, all of that is completely ignored. 
Okay, so let's go back to the chain rule. So again, the top line here, no assumptions, uh, totally, totally uncontroversial. Uh, just, just generate the words one at a time, conditioning on what came before. The n-gram model assumption or Markov assumption says I'm going to generate each word uh, and I'm going to condition on a fixed number of preceding words. So all of that fancy stuff is basically just saying there are n minus one words that came before, little n, uh, and those are the ones I'm going to look at. Everything else in the distant past is forgotten. Uh, and so what I have to estimate are these conditional probabilities of the, uh, the nth word given the n minus one that came before. So we call this an n minus one order Markov assumption, and that gives us an n-gram model. So the unigram model is n equals one, which means n minus one is zero, which means we condition on nothing. The, uh, the, the more common models that people talk about when they use n-gram modeling are bigrams for two, trigrams for three, four grams, five grams. And if you, if you trace through the history of NLP, the, the, the periods when people were using language models, you find there was a long period where trigram models were widely used. And then the machines got more powerful. We had more data. And so we, we started dipping our toes in and we found that you could use four gram models and they worked better if you had enough data. And then you could go to five gram models and, and so on. And so basically uh, the name of the game was, was what can you get away with? How many, uh, how many words can you condition on given the data that you have? Um, we'll just briefly point out No, let's talk about this a little bit. So, um, so let's apply the maximum likelihood principle. Uh, we want to estimate the probability of, uh, of the word V given some history of, uh, of N minus one words. We'll call the history H. How do, we, how do we get this probability? How do we estimate this? This is going to be one parameter in our model. Still event-based, still very discrete. I'll give you a hint. You're going to count things. Seven. Seven. That's what you said. No. Yes. That's exactly right. So, so it's basically, this is what you said. It's the number of times you saw V followed by H divided by the number of times you saw H. Okay. This, this is all the mathy stuff helping you, helping you convince you that that is how you should get there. I'll walk through it. This is what you're interested in. It's the conditional probability of V given H. I wrote in the random variables to be totally fastidious. You can, because of the definition of conditional probability, you know this is a ratio of the joint probability to the marginal probability of the right-hand side. Each of those, you can plug in the maximum likelihood estimate by counting and normalizing. This is the number of times you saw uh, you saw the two together. This is the number of times you saw the history. The, the ends in the denominator cancel and you end up with this ratio. A common mistake is to forget that, uh, that you need to divide by the number of times you saw the history. Sometimes people will use this and then uh, they will end up with very low number, very low probabilities. It's a sign of a, it's a bug. It's a common bug. It, for people, when people manually implement and grip models, which hopefully you won't have to do. Is that the lab? They don't have to do that. No. Okay. Good. In my class, people have to do it on a small amount of data because um, we have 10 weeks, not just, you know, one. Okay. So, um, so this is another kind of quick thing to make sure you understand. If you're given a sequence of words uh, and you have an n-gram model, how do you calculate the n-gram probability of that sequence of words? What do you have to do? There's no neural net. You can't call PyTorch. You're going to use the chain rule. Yes. How? Go through the words, one after the other. You look at each word in turn. There are two things you have to look up. The count of the word with the history and the count of its history. Move to the, you're going to take the ratio and multiply it in. Move to the next word. Look up the count of the history with the word, the count of the history. Take the ratio, multiply it in. Repeat until you get to the end, include the stop symbol. Okay, so in order to do this, you're going to need a data structure that stores counts 
or probabilities. You could do it. You could you could pre-compute all the probabilities. You could also store the count. You need to store that that count information in some table that makes it very easy to look up histories and words. Also note that you can't really share much computation across each step. For each word, you have to look up a probability or two counts. You're probably not going to see the same words. You might see the same word. You probably won't see it with the same history. You expect the computation to be linear in the sequence line, but it's a fixed amount of work for each word. Um, okay, so ngram models. I, you know, there's everything from the unigram on up. You can find. You can probably find very long ngram models in some papers these days. Um, this is an interesting kind of balancing act that you have to perform if you're going to use an engram an engram approach to language modeling. Um, n is, you know, it's like if n is small, like a unigram or a bigram model, your model is probably not going to learn very much about the language, and it's probably not going to generalize super well. But how, you know, how far can you go? How big can you make n? As n gets larger, there are some there are some dangers. One is that uh, the number of parameters, the number of things you have to store, is going to grow exponentially in the vocabulary size. I have heard it claimed, but I have not yet checked that uh, ngram language models from from about let's say 15 years ago actually had more parameters than today's largest neural models. For this reason, because because of this exponential growth with uh, with NV. Um, most of the time, most of the engrams that you're gonna that you're gonna uh, that 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 could exist right in that exponentially large space of possible n sequ n length sequences of v will never be observed at all. So so regardless of how clever you are about storing what you have seen, you're going to get a lot of zero probability engrams, just because the maximum likelihood estimate for something you've never seen is zero. Um, and so this is we call this data sparsity. Right. You may have heard of sparsity uh, as, a, as a kind of nice technique for making models more compact uh, in, with today's models. Uh, data sparsity is not that. It is a different thing. It's a problem where you just haven't seen all the events you could possibly see, and it, it creates problems for, for maximum likelihood estimates. We'll come back to that in a minute. Um, increasingly, as you increase the length of the engram model, you need more and more data to get reliable estimates Right for the same reason. Right. If you if you if you don't want everything to essentially be zero, uh, then you've just got to look at a whole lot of data. If you try and estimate a long n engram model on a small corpus, what you're essentially doing is you're moving back towards the creepy model that just memorizes the data. In fact, if you make n arbitrarily long, right? If you built an engram model and and made it made n larger than the training data, then you would basically just be memorizing the training data. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a beautiful, if you've heard of the bias variance trade-off in machine learning, this is a beautiful example. As you increase n, you're going to get higher variance, a lot more. You, you depend a lot more on the training data that you've seen. As you decrease n, you're making stronger assumptions, and you have a more biased model that's, that's more set in its ways and less likely to learn all the beautiful things about language that you could learn. Okay, so this leads me to... I don't know this. I, I kind of love this diagram, but I also realize it's a little noisy, but I, I, I still think um, it's a useful guide. So at the middle of, the, of, of this slide, you have a language model. OK, uh, and again, I'm trying to speak in, in general terms. This is something I think will stay true for a long time uh, and, and was true before we had the current models and will be true uh, long after. You have a language model. What are the ways you can make it better or what are the things you can do to it? Well, we've been talking about increasing it. Right. Um, that's sort of a special case for engram models of increasing the model capacity. You're making a, as you increase the engram length, you're letting your model see longer and longer sequences. Longer, it can it can learn longer patterns. Um, you're increasing the model capacity. You're making it more powerful. And when you do that, the things that will tend to happen will be the model will become more expensive computationally. For engram models, this is this is largely about memory. You have to store larger and larger numbers of counts. Uh, you will have more parameters. In, for engram models, the parameters are the, the probabilities associated with each of the n length sequences. You will probably get better and better fit to the training data to the point of creepiness if you go too far. You'll just memorize. Okay. Um, another thing that you can do with your language model is uh, give it just give it more training data. Okay. 
And um, that's, uh, what, what will be the result of that? Well, at least at training time, it will probably increase the computational cost. For NGRAM models, it's not so bad. You can, you can estimate these things. You can extract what you need, usually with one big pass over the training set. Um, so it's not such a big deal, but it's still going to cost more, let's be honest. Um, you generally expect that if you have sufficient model capacity, uh, you will generalize better to new data if you, if you trained on more data. More data is better data is a pretty good rule of thumb. Um, Okay, so you know that's a, that's always a good bet, and and the <laughs> the general trend uh, of language modeling over the past 30, 40 years has definitely been larger and larger amounts of data, and also increased model capacity. Okay, there's a third thing that I think is worth mentioning, and it's a little bit fuzzier, and it's it's but it's the one everybody always forgets. If you make better assumptions, if you improve the inductive bias of your model. Then you would you would you should also expect better generalization, and so this is something that I I think it's happened a few times in the history of language modeling where people have had some insight that they have then used to change the model, and uh, and they find that it works better, and people get you know people who are inclined to get excited about this get excited. I'll give you one example. Nobody really talks about this very much anymore, but um, in the late '90s. There, was, uh, there were a couple papers that showed that when you were doing language modeling, and at this time they were mainly doing language modeling for speech recognition, if you incorporated some explicit model of the syntactic structure of the sentences, like a tree out of Chomsky and linguistics, and you did it in a certain way, this was adding inductive bias, it was encouraging a certain way of thinking about the history of, the wor of each word, its syntactic context, you could get better generalization to test data. Okay, very exciting result at the time because people, you know, people at that time were very, very interested in finding ways to use linguistic insights to improve NLP. We didn't know how to make NLP better. There wasn't that much data. Linguistics was seen as one of the tools that would help us. Um, and so you'd get this, you'd see, you saw a couple of results where the language models got better because of this sort of linguistic stuff. And there have been other examples. This is just the one I remember because it was the first one I knew about. And then, you, you know, what? guess what happened? People got more data, and they found that they could beat the. If you just had more data, you could beat that, and you could stick with the simple thing. Okay, and this is—I I don't know. They, there are people who draw big lessons from that and say, "Don't be clever; just get more data." Like the, the, that—that that idea has been over 25 years. I've heard people say that a million times: "Just get more data." Um, I, I think it's—you know—that's historically in our lifetimes that's generally been the pattern. Uh, but I still think this blue pathway is important to point out. Because sometimes people do have insights and they do, uh, they do lead to better generalization. And I think part of what we see with modern language models may be a little bit explainable by better inductive bias, better assumptions, even if we don't fully understand it yet. OK, um, OK, we're good. So um, one, one way to improve inductive bias that was incredibly important uh, for language modeling in the early days, back in the Engram times, um, had to do with these zeros. Okay, so if you apply, remember, if you apply the maximum likelihood estimate to Engram models, and you do it in the, in the, in the you stick to the formulas, you're going to get a lot of zeros. You're going to have a lot of uh, Engram probabilities that are zero. And so the smoothing game said, don't choose non-smooth models. And smooth here means you have, smooth means you don't have zeros. So you want every possible engram that you could ever occur to always have a strictly positive value. How do you accomplish that and still make things sum to one so that perplexity is meaningful? Okay, so the simple thing, the simplest thing to do, I'm, I'm, I could spend an hour on this and you would be bored, um, but there, there were many papers written on this topic and it was, it was you know, it really drove people crazy. Um, I don't know, I shouldn't say that. I should say it, it inspired a lot of geeks to spend a lot of time uh, trying to come up with good formulas. The simplest, you should know, you should know a, a little bit about this. So the simplest thing to do is you pick a value lambda, which is positive. It could be one, it could be 0.1, something like that. And every count of everything in the, in the data, uh, including the counts of zero, you add lambda to it. Um, I always used to call this add lambda smoothing, but my, my, uh, my friend Jacob wrote this textbook and he gave it an, he called it lidstone smoothing. Apparently it was, it had an official name and I didn't even know. Okay, so so um, you learn you learn new things sometimes. 
So you just pick this value. So this is this, this lambda, it's a hyperparameter. You have to choose it. You have to decide how much smoothing to do. If lambda is large, you're really smoothing out the probability distribution. If lambda is tiny, you're doing a little bit of smoothing. It's like insurance, right? I don't want, I don't want a perplexity of zero, so I add a little bit to every count. That's the starting point. And then from there, there's 100 techniques that get interestingly more complicated, have different theoretical motivations. The one that, that tended to work best um, you know, for like 25 years, probably still the best thing going if you're using these kinds of models, was called modified Knazer Nye smoothing. And uh, it, was, it was described in a paper by Chen and Goodman. You can look it up very complicated. It's counterintuitive. It actually involves discounting. So large counts, you steal some probability from those and then redistribute it. It's like socialism. Um, um, and it works. Like it, it worked great. If you see, if you see people using n-gram models, they will probably today they are probably using a package that implement implements some kind of modified Knazer Nye. Um, all of this, all of this complication came from the requirement that the probabilities sum exactly to one for every n-gram and therefore for every sequence. But if you don't care about perplexity, you can relax a little bit. And it took until 2007 for people to kind of realize this. And guess, guess where they worked? Who, who, what kind of people would come up with something and just say, we don't care about perplexity. Keep it simple. Use as much data as you can. Google. 2007, Google is very interested in making their machine translation systems better. They're very interested in doing that by making their language models bigger and bigger, in this sense, bigger in the number, in the amount of training data. They're using um, MapReduce style compute, uh, you know, spread the computation, build the language model over many, many, many machines. And they, they came up with something called stupid backoff, which basically does a clever little transformation on the counts that does not guarantee that things will sum to exactly one. Okay, so they basically just gave up on that. So you couldn't use perplex a stupid backup model. You couldn't you couldn't measure its perplexity, but you could use it in a machine translation system and measure the performance gain on machine translation, and it was very good. Okay, so this is you know another reminder not to get too hung up on the particular evaluation metrics that a research community likes. Sometimes there are uh, there are ends that justify doing doing things that uh, that, that 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 work around those those measures. Um, okay, so this brings us to another kind of important point. This is kind of like methodological point about, uh, about NLP. Whenever we, we choose some general technical approach, there are always some decisions you have to make, micro decisions, about the execution of the model. Um, and these will affect perplexity. They will affect task performance. They will affect everything else. They matter. We call these hyperparameters. Uh, things like how how long is your n-gram? That's a, that we could call that a hyperparameter. Or what is the lambda value? Um, and so these are annoying, right? Because they matter, but we don't really we don't usually have a lot of deep insights about them, and they're not usually very interesting. Like it's if somebody came up to you and said, you know, lambda of 0.63 is really good. It's like, you know, it's like if they were a senior grad student in your lab. And they'd been working for a long time with the data sets that you worked with in your lab. And it was like, oh yeah, that's, you know, it's like, it's like helpful. It saves you some time, but it's not like a deeply theoretical claim, right? About the nature of language or the universe um, that, that lambda 0.63. It's not like, you know, some physics constant or something, right? Um, people sometimes talk about hyperparameters that way. I think you should have a healthy skepticism about that, right? They're important. They matter. Don't ignore them. That information is useful. Uh, but there are a couple a couple things to remember. Um, th th there aren't necessarily a priori reasons to inform the choices, right? Um, what what I recommend, if you have no idea what to do, is try different. You know, be an experimentalist. Try different values. Uh, use a validation data set to choose them. Sometimes you have to do this with a smaller, cheaper model than the one you really want to actually train, right? Because it can be very expensive to build the full model. So sometimes you need you need some tricks. But do not break the cardinal rule of machine learning. Do not use the test data to choose the hyperparameter because it's cheating. You've now let the you've now let the uh, let the test out of the uh, out of the lockbox. Um, also, don't use the training data uh, because what tends to happen when you uh, when you choose your hyperparameters on the training data is you just do better on the training data and you generalize less well. 
right? If you chose the n-gram length on the training data, you would probably choose a very large n because you can do extremely well on the training data with very, very long n-grams. You're memorizing, right? Okay, so validation set, very important kind of thing to keep, to keep, uh, to keep in, your, in your back pocket. Um, if you want a better solution, I, I, I sometimes like to write papers about uh, hyperparameters and other methodological things that come up. Um, what's really the best thing, instead of like manually trying some stuff and then like choosing the one that worked best on your validation test and like forgetting exactly what you tried and how many things you tested, a better, more systematic thing is to use a search. Use a search procedure. Uh, a very simple thing to do is define a range of the hyperparameters. Often you have multiple hyperparameters you have to choose at the same time. Define a range for each one and then do a random search in that space within that box. And then, uh, you know, report the procedure that you used, how many iterations you used, the values that you ended up selecting. And, uh, and then if somebody else wants to repeat your experiment, they'll probably get results similar to yours. Science, it's a good idea. Okay, um, so Ngram models, stepping back. Very easy to understand. Nobody had to learn any math. We've kept all the math till later in the lecture. Uh, very cheap. Uh, we talked about using MapReduce. There was a whole book about, about doing NLP with MapReduce in 2010. Um, very, very easy to, to engineer these kinds of models. You don't, need, you don't need special expertise. And when training data is scarce, and for certain kinds of applications that don't, uh, don't need incredibly accurate next word prediction, they're fine. Uh, and, and so you may, you may be in a situation where building an Ngram language model is the right thing to do, especially if there's, it, it, you know, languages with relatively little data. Um, this is not a crazy, it's not a crazy thing to do. Um, but, you know, we still are making, as we will be throughout the lecture, this fixed known vocabulary assumption. Um, the Markov assumption is, is linguistically inaccurate. Nobody believes this is how language works. Nobody believes that you just have a finite fixed history of words and you forget the distant things that you said. If, if they did believe that, then you know, this lecture would be very puzzling, right? Because I keep referring back to things I talked about earlier. Um, and then there's this data sparseness problem, which you know, I gave you the Ngram model and then I said, oh, there's this smoothing thing. And I gave you one slide and said we could spend an hour on it. That, was, that made it very complicated. Um, so, so getting the smoothing right, that was a whole research agenda. Um, and so, you know, it's sort of it's sort of unsatisfying that yes, it's simple, but then there's this extra little bit of work you have to do that's incredibly complicated and counterintuitive. Okay, um, maybe now's a good time to pause and, and take questions because I think we're we haven't no we have till ten thirty. I feel like we should go a little farther because yeah, I'm watching the slide count and I'm maybe dragging just a bit. So okay, so so let's go to neural nets. You learned about neural nets the other day, right? So I'm not, I'm not going to give you a full, I'm going to give you kind of my take on uh, how to think about neural nets. But basically, for language modeling, the key, the key insight when we move to a neural language model is instead of having a lookup for a word and a fixed length history, exact word and history, we're going to have a vector function uh, where the probability distribution over the next word is Give, is derived by taking an encoding of the history with some parameters and passing it through a neural net. So, so what's happening here is the history of, of the past set of words, somehow we're going to decide what information to keep, what information to ignore. Um, and then we're going to transform this encoding, which is going to be a, a continuous valued encoding, think vector or matrix, uh, and we're going to transform it into a distribution over the next word by applying a discrete mathematical function that depends on these parameters. And uh, the transformation is usually described as a series of simple things, simple transformations or layers. And the usual thing is some combination of linear transformations and nonlinear transformations. Okay, I hate the name neural network. I hate it. I tried to come up with other names. I failed. Um, but the name, it, it's like designed to make us confused, okay? It, what does it make you think of? It makes you think of neurons. It makes you think of brains. I think that's unhelpful, okay? Um, it adds, it makes these things more mysterious than they need to be. What is it really? What is, it's really a function that takes learned parameters, theta, and inputs, and maps them to outputs. 
And everything has to be real valued vectors, matrices, or tensors. Okay, everything here is going to be continuous. That's actually going to be one of, the, one of the reasons it took a while to figure out how to make neural language models, because language, as we have presented it up till now, is discrete. It's about sequences of words from a fixed, finite, discrete vocabulary. Okay, so, so the, other, the other thing that kind of makes a neural net a neural net is that it's pretty much always differentiable with respect to the parameters. And it's pretty much always got some kind of nonlinearities with respect to the input. Those two things are important. Uh, and we'll, we'll see many, uh, many examples as we go. Um, so what does nonlinear mean? It means that there's no matrix A uh, such that you can multiply uh, A by the input and get the same uh, values that you would get out of the neural net for every vector. Um, okay, so what are we going to do? What are we going to need? We're going to need two components. Um, first, we need an encoder that takes word histories and maps them into vectors or matrices. And then we need to be able to interpret the output as a probability distribution. Okay, so this is, uh, you, you probably already have seen some of the tools that we're gonna use here, but I, again, it's nice to see, kind of motivate what we're gonna use before we start defining how we're gonna solve the problem. So let's do, let's do like the very first simplest neural language model. I'm gonna call it version zero, because it's not really a neural language model. Um, but it bridges the gap between what we were doing with n-gram models and what's going to come later. And after this, we'll take the coffee break. So I didn't say this before, but there is a way to think about the language modeling problem where you're predicting the next word as classification. It's classification over a very large V-sized set of labels, but you can think about the history as the input and the next word as just a label. You're labeling the history with the next word. And so if you wanted to do it this way, you could reduce the whole language modeling problem to supervised classification. And in this setting, the training data gives you, if you have n words in the training data, you get n instances, one per word. Each word is a label for its own history. This is not usually the way people talk about language modeling, but it's, it's really not that far off. Um, one thing that maybe gives you a little bit of pause is that the instances that you have in this data set are not independent of each other. They overlap a lot. Right, each each one is sort of shifted from the one shifted by one word uh, position from the one that came before. So it's a little bit different from the usual classification setup, but that doesn't that's not a showstopper. It's just it's just sort of like you know different. Um, so you know, for example, uh, what, what one classifier I, I always liked back in the days of classification was multinomial logistic regression. Uh, so, so here the probability function was, well, you take your history in your word, your, your candidate next word, you featureize it somehow. Usually you, you would have to write down these features by hand and decide what, uh, what aspects of, uh, of these, uh, this, this pairing, this engram uh, was going to benefit or harm its probability. Uh, and then each of those features would have a weight theta. You take the inner product of the feature vector with the weight vector, you get a score. You make it positive by exponentiating it, and then you normalize it by the scores, the sum of the scores of all possible alternate other words. Is this familiar? You've seen multinomial logistic regression or something like it, hopefully somewhere. Sometimes this, this X divided by the sum of all the X, this is called softmax. All right, that's the, that's the only nonlinearity here. Um, otherwise, it's linear. In, in the input, but, uh, but basically, you know, your choice of features of the pairing of H with V together tells you everything you need to encode uh, this, uh, this, this uh, choice, uh, and you can turn it into a nice probability uh, using that softmax transformation. One of the nice things, by the way, about the softmax is that exponential never gives you back a zero, right, except with underflow problems, so you don't have to think about smoothing. This will always give you a non-zero value for every word in the vocabulary, modulo underflow. Um, but you have to choose the features, okay? And this is like one of the reasons you didn't see language models built this way was that when, when you ask people what features should you use for language modeling, they always just kept coming back to engrams, right? So the features end up being maybe, you know, maybe engrams of different lengths, maybe engrams where you cover up one word, Maybe you stem the words or do other transformations on the words. Maybe this is a good way to incorporate some linguistic information about morphology or something like that. But basically, people don't, in general, most people don't enjoy engineering features by hand. 
And so, you know, this is sort of a stepping stone. Um, by the way, uh, th this kind of model was incredibly popular in NLP. They, they emerged, they, they, get, they, they have a lot of different names in different research communities. In NLP, we often call them maximum entropy models. Uh, and you can find papers on maximum entropy language models, uh, but they were very costly. They were extremely expensive, right? Sound familiar? <laughs> that, that, that story just keeps coming back. They were too expensive, so they never really took off. Um, there were specialized algorithms for training them that you had to, you had to almost have a PhD in math to understand. Um, and in general, what happened was people, as people use these kinds of models more and more for different things in NLP, they realized that you, this was, you could use convex optimization. We'll come back to SGD in a little while, but I, I want to, I want to pick your brain and see if you, if you get the insight. Why were they expensive? Um, what made them impractical? I'm going to show the equation again. Why would this be a pain in the neck for, for, for language modeling? Yes, you have to sum over the whole vocabulary down here. Okay, for every word in the vocabulary at every position, right? So it's still like the runtime of calculating the probability of a sequence of words was still linear in the sequence of words, but it was also linear in the vocabulary size. Very unpleasant at the time, right? Now we don't shy away from this so much. Um, now I think these, these would be fine given today's, uh, today's computational offerings, but uh, it's the feature part that I think would make that would, would turn people off, like having to think about the features. Okay, we're at 1030. We're about halfway through. We'll close with a picture of the kitten. Multinomial logistic regression as a language model, it's the bridge between the engrams we talked about first and what's to come. Uh, and I think it's easier to learn those models now that we have covered the basic principles, the stuff that doesn't change. And it's okay, let's go have some coffee. Come on. Okay, so just a small side note, uh, completely decoupled from the, from the lecture. Um, as you know, we're thankfully past COVID and everything's okay. But if you're not feeling okay, right, wear a mask just in case. Uh, if you want to wear a mask because you feel like it, do it and feel absolutely no pressure, right? There's legally no obligation, but if you feel like you're not okay, wear a mask. If you don't really feel okay, the lectures are online. You can also rest at the hotel, right? Uh, but feel uh, it's it's important that if you're not feeling okay, you're not listening around people, just in case. Um, we had no problem last year, so it should be okay, but just in case everybody feels better, right? Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks for coming back. I'm never sure what's going to happen. Um, all right, so we covered a whole bunch of like basic ground ground rules for language models. We motivated the problem. We talked about uh, engrams and introduced a lot of the key ideas around um, how you can make language models better. Uh, and then we took a step in the direction of using what you learned uh, earlier about neural networks. Uh, but the first thing we did wasn't really a neural net, right? It was, it was if, if it's a neural net, it's the dead simplest thing you could do. Um, what we're going to do next is uh, is move in the move towards modern times, um, and we're going to see a lot of different neural network approaches to building language models. Um, and uh, and and so I think the general ideas uh, that that we see here they've been used for language modeling, but they've been used for lots of other problems in NLP as well. Um, and so you know uh, everything kind of transfers over, and there's there's an I, I think you wouldn't have you wouldn't have noticed it so much until we started seeing this stream of this sort of parade of neural network models over the years, uh, how much different problems in NLP tend to borrow from each other. And so, uh, so I think learning, learning the sequence of things for language modeling is nice because you get all these other things sort of for free, almost for free. Um, okay, so the, the two kind of things that, that, that needed to happen for us to get really serious about this uh, and, and to start seeing major improvements in language modeling, I think boiled down to two central ideas. The first one is embedding words as vectors, word embeddings, word vectors, which you, you've probably heard of. We'll talk about those. Um, and then and, and that, that idea is sort of taking 
this fundamentally discrete thing and finding a way to, again, encode uh, uh, what we think of as a discrete uh, sequence as a sequence of vectors, uh, which makes everything a little bit more amenable to the, the neural way of, of, of solving problems. Uh, the second is, uh, is increasing capacity. So just like making longer and longer engrams in our engram models gives us more capacity and lets the model learn more rich patterns about language, layering uh, in neural networks is, is a, a straightforward way to give your model greater capacity and let it learn a richer set of distributions over the next word. Um, some of the some of the things uh, will will not change. So we'll continue to maximize likelihood. Um, we will uh, we will not. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about uh, how how we go about doing uh, stochastic gradient descent. Um, but uh, but the principle is the same, right? So uh, so it turned out uh, we had this sort of fortuitous set of circumstances with engram models that we didn't need fancy algorithms to choose the parameters. There was a closed form. Uh, that isn't the case anymore. Now you have to use an optimization technique, but you've seen this. Uh, and so we can, we can kind of take that as a given and, and just sort of assume if I give you a neural net that has certain properties, you can run stochastic uh, a gradient descent and get uh, decent parameters for it. Um, one of the things that changes is that the, the likelihood function that you're optimizing with the, with the models we'll talk about from here on is no longer going to be convex in, uh, in the parameters, which means... Um, I, I like to use the metaphor of being uh, airdropped on a, a very rough terrain like Mount Rainier in Seattle. It's this big mountain right outside the city. Um, and, you know, if you look at it, you're like, oh, wait, it has multiple peaks. And, you know, if you get zoom in really close, you see that it goes up and down and up and down. If you landed, uh, if you were airdropped somewhere on Mount Rainier and uh, told to find your way down, oh, and you're blindfolded. Um, and all you can really do is like use your feet and feel which way things are going, right? Like, oh, that feels like a down. Whoa, right. down, down, down. It's, it's a little, that's what you're doing with stochastic gradient descent. Um, and really all you can hope for is like you find maybe a shallow dish. You may not get all the way to the bottom. And this is like, you know, mathematically, this is worth pointing out. Um, it was very different with, uh, with, uh, with the, the, the closed form models, right? You, you did a calculation and you got provably the optimal point. It's like, you know, you don't even have to roll down down the valley. There's just a, a way to step right there immediately. Um, this is this is computationally going to be more expensive. It's a little bit unnerving when you first start thinking about this. In fact, in practice, for reasons I don't think we fully understand, it doesn't matter. Uh, you 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 do SGD, you follow the gradient, and you get to a pretty good solution, and things work well, and we don't we don't stress over it too much. Um, okay, so this is how we get to word vectors. I think the, the way I like to think about it is, uh, is to con I always contrast with the older thing. So one way to think about uh, embedding words as vectors is what we call one hot vectors. So for every word in the vocabulary, you're going to have a vector uh, that is all zeros except for a single one. And we're going to make the dimensionality of this vector v so that every word can have a different dimension where it has a one, but it has zeros everywhere else. So these are totally orthogonal. And, uh, and, and basically every word has a unique vector that embeds it. And this doesn't really, this adds no information. This is not very interesting. It's just a way of making words into vectors. And it, it, it's, it preserves all the information without adding anything new. And if you look at this, you see, okay, all words are sort of like equally far apart from each other, right? They're all, they're all just sort of different. They're just discrete. They're, if, you, if you wanted to visualize this, you should imagine I guess like a very high dimensional polytope. If you can imagine a polytope with more than three dimensions and then the words are like vertices, right? Or like, a, you, you get the idea. They're all equal, equally far apart from each other. There's no notion of like two words being closer or farther away or anything like that. <clears throat> a neural language model is gonna, you can think of it, I, I don't think we actually implement it this way anymore, but you can think of it as saying, first map every word to one of these uh, one hot vectors, and then multiply that one hot vector by a matrix. We'll call it M. M is V rows by D dimensions. So D, little d, the dimensionality of your word vectors, it's a hyperparameter. No mystery. 
It's just something you have to, there's no magic. There's no, it's just, you have to choose. Uh, but the idea is when you multiply your one hot by, by this M, you're choosing a row out of, this, out of that big matrix, call it MV, and that's the embedding of the word. And that could be anything. And, and, and so in, in fact, the, this matrix, uh, you, it's free parameters. And there are many ways of thinking about how you build that matrix. But the point is that once you do this, you now have kind of a way of representing words um, uh, as vectors. I, I like to think of M as just more parameters. Right, they have to be trained. We're going to probably use some gradient gradient based method to train them. Um, but the, but but okay, so that's the technical stuff. The interesting thing here, I think, and the reason people got so fascinated by these, we went through an era of where where NLP was dominated by thinking about word vectors for a few years. I don't know, maybe like I want to say twenty ten to twenty fifteen, somewhere in there. People just love word vectors. And the, the, the idea is, really, but they go back much, they're much older. They're, they're, you can find papers even from the early 90s where people were thinking about this. The idea is super cool. Words can be closer or farther apart from each other. They, they live in some kind of space. In fact, one of the early papers called it word space. They live in a, in a continuous space. Words that have maybe similar meanings, maybe, are closer together. Apple and banana. Uh, and words that have very different meanings are farther apart, or maybe they're, they're close in some dimensions, but not others. Maybe all the days of the week are close in some dimensions, but, but spread out along another one. Exactly how you use a continuous space to lay out the words depends, of course, on the algorithm that you use to, to assign the values. Uh, but, but having this ability, having this capacity to assign words different positions in a high dimensional space, it's very interesting. And I think it's interesting for linguistic reasons as well as for... Uh, for engineering ones. Okay, so um, so I'm just going to say a little bit about this. Okay, um, the way I the way I present the material today, we're focusing on language models, and we're kind of walking through this progression of language models, and we have to go on a tangent to talk about word vectors for a bit. There's a completely different way one could teach this material, um, starting from word vectors. So word vectors emerged in in a separate research thread, independent of language modeling driven by information retrieval, maybe driven by some questions in cognitive science. We could easily spend an hour on that topic. Um, and in fact, we could have started from word vectors and worked our way up to language models. And I, 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 wrote, a, I wrote a piece in the, the CACM a couple years back where I took that approach and kind of got to models like BERT starting from word vectors. Um, I think that's interesting. If that, if that intrigues you, go, go take a look at that, at that article. Um, so the way, you know, if you wanted to just build word vectors, it's worth talking a little bit about how this can be done. Mostly, most of the methods that you find, they start from co-occurrence statistics. So you look at how often a word V appears before or just after different possible contexts V prime. Okay, this is a, the fundamental idea here. It's called distributional semantics. Words, uh, the, 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 the context that words appear in is what's going to inform whether two words are similar or not. Two words are similar if they tend to appear in similar contexts. Okay, so, so related to that, we can kind of turn this into a little bit of a machine learning problem by saying, suppose I have a word in a nearby position, can I guess the word at position I from its neighbors? Feels like classification. Feels a little bit like language modeling even. Um, and in fact, if you look at the popular methods that emerged that, that were widely used for building, just building word vectors, they were things like, Skipgram, a continuous bag of words. There's a package called Word. Who's heard of Word to Vec? Great. Okay. So, so this package implemented a number of different techniques. And they were basically, basically what you were doing was training little neural classifiers, relatively lightweight, relatively cheap. It turns out what you're doing is very closely related to matrix factorization of a, of a kind of co-occurrence co statistics matrix. There's a lot of ways to look at what's going on here. But, but the point is many methods emerge for basically building the word vectors without thinking about a language model or some other task or anything else. It's worth knowing about this. Sometimes these, these tools are useful. Today, um, the most common thing is actually just to treat that M matrix, the embedding matrix, as more parameters. It's not special. It's initialized randomly. It's learned during language model training. And it's just kind of part of, part of everything else. And maybe it's a big part. Um, but you know, you will occasionally find cases where people pre-train M using some different algorithm like Skipgram, plug it in, keep those values fixed, and just train the other parameters, or maybe use them as initial values and fine-tune the matrix along with everything else. All of these options are possible and available, and the computational constraints 
of your project might uh, would, would probably be a factor in deciding how to go about doing this. Um, the appeal of the second and third options is that if, if that pre-training, if, if you can get word vectors that are really good for cheap, then, uh, then maybe you can focus your, your training computation later on the other language model parameters rather than training everything together. I think this, this is something that, that's like kind of emerged as a, a common pattern with very large complex models is you, do, you can do training in stages. You can use one criterion or one set of maybe larger data for some parts that are cheaper. You can shift, you can do other things later. And we often, I think we often forget that, uh, that you, you don't have to do just one thing to get the full set of parameters in one pass. Um, so this is, this is kind of an early pre-trained fine-tuned setting that, that you can find in the literature. Okay, so we have we now have a way of mapping words to vectors. It came from some off-the-shelf method, or maybe it's just more parameters. But what it means is that now when we see a sequence of words, V1 through VK, what's actually going to happen when we when we do our computations for our language model, we're going to convert it to a sequence of vectors, M sub V1, M sub V2, and so on. Um, now notice that that uh, that when we do language modeling. When we encode a sequence of words in the history, one of the key criteria for doing this in the most flexible way possible is dealing with the fact that inputs are variable length. Now, we, we avoided this completely with n-gram models. We said, we're always going to have a fixed length history that we look at. We never have to think about anything longer than the n-gram. And that's actually where things started with, uh, with the neural story. They started with basically doing a neural version of n-grams. But I like to point this out that this variable length, if we could find a way to deal with variable length input, we might not need to make an n-gram assumption. We might be able to use longer histories. So let's just put that, put that aside for now and, and think, about, uh, think about what we would do if we were going to build, uh, build n-gram-like language models uh, that are neural. OK, I said the other piece of being neural is you have multiple layers. And I, you know, my, my view of this, maybe slightly idiosyncratic, is that most of the details about those layers are just not interesting at all, okay? And, and you'll, probably, you'll probably feel that attitude coming out as I teach you the different models. What's important is that there's sort of two things that alternate. One of them is affine transformations where you take an input vector V, multiply it by a matrix, maybe add something and get a new vector, maybe of a different dimensionality. Linear transformations. This is, what this is giving you is weights and biases as parameters. Okay, so you're, you're, you're just sort of projecting into a new linear space and nothing, nothing super, nothing's really changing dramatically, except you're kind of reweighting and combining things. The other piece is the nonlinearities. And we saw the softmax earlier. Uh, the other one that comes up, the other one, other two that come up a fair bit are the, the hyperbolic tangent. This is an element wise transformation that essentially squashes values. So if the inputs go from negative infinity up to positive infinity, the tan H squashes them between negative one and positive one. Extreme values get pushed down to, to plus or minus one. Uh, the sigmoid does something similar between zero and one. Uh, rectified linear units uh, are another nonlinearity that basically takes negative values and makes them zero and leaves other values the same. And there are others, okay? There's not any, it, for, for, to my understanding, there's not any deep reason uh, you should like or dislike or have any feelings about any of these. Um, they have emerged. They're kind of like hyper, you know, hyper parameters uh, in different kinds of models. People tend to prefer uh, different choices here. Uh, but I, I tend to think uh, this is probably not um, where the, ma I mean, the, the magic is the combination of the linear and the nonlinear and the repeated layers. And it's not even magic, right? The other thing to notice here is that everything is going to be differentiable or at least sub-differentiable. So, you can differentiate through a linear transformation. You can differentiate through tan H. This is differentiable except at one point, and it's sub-differential at that point, so you don't have to worry. Um, okay, so again, the pattern you will see in every model I show you and in every model you find in the literature is alternate between affine, nonlinear, affine, nonlinear, affine, nonlinear over and over as many times as you want. And more layers, the general rule, more layers increases the capacity. It means you'll have more parameters. It means it will be more expensive to run the data through the model. It will probably lead to better training data fit because you have more parameters now and you have more, you can express more complex functions of inputs to outputs. 
So nothing has changed. This is our same language model research story. Um, increasing model capacity. Well, we used to say make longer engrams. Now we say make deeper models. That's all the deep and deep learning means. Increase capacity. Um, increasing, if you do that, you're probably also going to need more data. The general rule, again, is if you have a richer, more powerful model, you need more, you're probably going to need more data to fit it well. Or conversely, if you have more data, you can afford uh, to experiment with more with higher model capacity and, and worry less about overfitting. Um, notice I didn't talk about this before. I'll come, I'll come back to this. Uh, you know, these are the kinds of things you can actually expect confidently. Better generalization, better fit to training data. The, 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 there are some question marks, though, going up to these other things. So, you know, the, the thing we talked about as your, your criterion for research success is reduced test set perplexity. Certainly a good thing, certainly lets you write papers, but there's no guarantee that you're going to actually see that fitting better to the training data might actually be worse. Uh, it, could, it could be a sign that you're doing better. Really, what, really, this is the thing people want. They want better generalization, and that should show up in better test set perplexity. Now, do, if I get better perplexity, does that mean I'll get better application performance? Maybe. Often, yes. Often enough that the research community will let you publish on this, uh, but there's no guarantee. And better generalization should lead to you know, better theories, advanced knowledge. Yeah, maybe sometimes hard to know. Right, so so you can't you can't assume uh, that that uh, that this goes hand in hand with these higher goals, but it's you know it's sort of what we hope for. I think that you know it's these things at the top that get me out of bed in the morning more than reduced test set complexity. Okay, so here it is. This is the this is probably the first model that was advertised and and widely viewed as a, a neural language model. Um, it, it came out in uh, 20 years ago, 20, 2003, and let's gaze upon this beautiful equation. So um, first thing to notice is the M's, those are your word vectors, and it's only taking as input the word vectors from the preceding N minus one words. So we're summing J equals one to N minus one, HJ, HJ. Those are the J words in the engram context. So fixed, fixed window of history. That's important. Uh, each of those is getting passed through, well, let's start here at the deepest part. It's getting an affine transformation. Everything in pink is a parameter. Okay, so matrices and vector parameters. Then it goes through a tan H nonlinearity. Then we do another affine transformation and we bring back those word vectors again a second time. Why not? Uh, so now we have an affine transformation and finally we do the softmax. So what this is doing at the end is it's taking scores uh, in a, 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 that are a, a, a vector of scores that is a vocabulary length dimension and uh, turning it into a probability distribution over the next word. Everything is learned using stochastic gradient descent. Um, is it a deep model? I don't know. I would say that's, how do you, what do you count? You count the nonlinearities? There's two nonlinearities, so maybe it's a two level. Is that... That jive with people's intuition? Is that how we count? Number of nonlinearities, so two. It's a two layer neural net. Um, I don't know. What do you think? Intuitive? There's some hyperparameters. You have to choose the dimensionalities D and H of, of the different matrices and things. The word vector dimensionality, the hidden layer dimensionality. I saw this and I was like, I have no idea what to think. Okay, this has, this has no connection to anything I've ever seen about, first of all, we're manipulating elements of word vectors, which could be anything. Uh, we're doing these linear, what does the tan H do? It makes it nonlinear, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's like, this is a class of functions. Choosing the values for all those parameters is gonna give you a prediction. And it turns out if you optimize this to do a good job at predicting, it, 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 it ends up working pretty well. Um, I, you know, I like to think about these things in terms of the computation graph. Uh, so this is my attempt at drawing the computation graph. What you have here are the, the five uh, word, words from the history. So these are one hot vectors. They get multiplied by M. Now you have smaller, five smaller word vectors. They get transformed a few times through the different layers. Finally, the softmax, and you're back out to a, a V length vector that sums to one, and that's the distribution over the next word. Make sense? Not super deep. It was very expensive to train this model in the early 2000s. 
Um, people attempted to explain what was going on. It's kind of like multinomial logistic regression, except the features were not chosen by hand. Instead, they are concatenations of context word embeddings. Um, but these are learned themselves. So even the feature, I know everything about the features is just totally learned. Uh, and so, so I don't know. I think the reason that you, you're kind of, uh, you're, it kind of works. Well, I'll come back to why I think it works. But, um, but you can't, it's not like an n-gram probability where you can look at the n-gram you can look at the value that comes out of the table and say, oh, yes, this is a high probability engram, or this is very low probability. The single parameters won't have any intuitive meaning at all. Uh, you can't look at a word vector and, and make sense of it. Uh, it only makes sense in the context of all the other word vectors and all the parameters you're using. Um, let's look at how many parameters it has. You can, you can take all of those matrices and, and tensors and things and multiply out their dimensionalities, and you get this lovely formula for the size of the model. They were working with an 18,000 word vocabulary after removing out of vocabularies. They tried a few different values for the dimensionalities D and H. They used a five gram, uh, I think it was a six, it's a six gram model, five word history. So at the end of the day, they ended up with a dimensionality that was 30,000 plus about 400 times the vocabulary size. This is better than a bigram model, which would be V squared. Okay, so they're actually using way less parameters than, uh, than the comparable six gram model would be. That would be V to the six. Um, they also tried some variations where they forced this A to zero, so cutting out 300 times V of the parameters. And that actually performed a bit better, but it changed the tra training dynamics. So there's, there's weird trade-offs here between what parameters you include or don't include and how well it works, but also the amount of computation it, it takes to, to get performance to, to be where you want it. Um, they also did things like averaging the word vectors in the context instead of concatenating them, and that made a smaller model. Turns out that's related to some other things in the literature. I don't know. People were excited by this. I think, you know, I think basically the way we thought about it then, and I don't think this is wildly off, was that forget, forget the fact that the features are not intuitive. You're learning features. You're learning functions that look at little pieces of the input and kind of, you know, uh, flag different kinds of things and fire on different, different, uh, different you know, recurring patterns. Um, but what you're, what you're doing with these multiple layers is you're learning combinations of those features that you would never be able to get with a linear model. Even if your linear model had everything the word vectors had, the multiple layers and the nonlinearities are letting you get, get new ways of combining them. And the classic way to talk about this is to look at the XOR. Did you cover XOR in the neural net lecture? Yeah. So if you have Y equals XOR uh, of, of two inputs, you can't come up with a linear function that will solve this for you. Um, but if you can conjoin different features and have multiple layers, you can, you can easily get this. And so one of the things people were doing with multinomial logistic regression style models was like greedy search for new features. So you start with features you can choose by hand, and then you try and search for good ways to combine them that will lead to better likelihood. The problem is this kind of greedy, discrete search, it, it's very expensive. It doesn't, it's not, it just doesn't work as well as converting everything to continuous and then doing gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're smoothly exploring lots and lots of approximately conjunctive features. It's like a relaxed problem. And we just kind of slide down Mount Rainier and, uh, and find a local optimum. Um, but, you know, I, I, overall what's happening, you know, the mathematical answer is all of these, rep the representations of the words, the representations of the histories, all the parameters, everything is being simultaneously tuned just for this next word prediction task. And amazingly, with enough parameters, with enough computation, uh, and, and this, this key idea of word embeddings, you actually manage to get good, good language modeling performance. And we don't have to talk about training. I don't have to cover SGD again. I don't have to talk about the chain rule. Um, everything, everything's been covered in, in the lecture before in, in some reference books uh, and textbooks. Once you, once you understand those principles, we don't have to talk about it. The only thing I like to remind you of, again, the, the log likelihood function is not convex. So when, what that means experimentally is that when you evaluate the perplexity at the end, you're actually not, it's not exactly an evaluation of the model or the model family. It's actually also an, eval an, an evaluation of the initial parameter you started with, which is usually a random choice, and the algorithm you use for estimating it. 
Okay, right now, there's, I, I, from what I see, there's not a lot of change in the algorithms we use to, to train uh, the networks. Things have more or less converged on a stable set of choices. But for a while, there was a lot of talk about this. And there were many different techniques for like changing the learning rate over time and trying to get convergence to be faster. And so a lot of things end up getting packaged together in any experiment. And it's important to recognize that because it could change. Um, okay, but expensive. Nothing new in NLP. There's always, there's always models that are, that are too expensive for the rest of us. Uh, just calculating the log likelihood and its gradient uh, over five epochs of, across the training data. I forget what data set they used. It was nowhere near as large as the ones we use today. This took three weeks to train on 40 CPUs. That sounds like nothing to you. Three weeks doesn't sound very long for training a language model, uh, but that was a long time. If I, if I, when I was a grad student, which I, which I was in 2003, and I trained a model that took three weeks on all 40 CPUs in our lab, which was about how many we had, the other, guess what would happen to me? The other grad students in the lab would stop talking to me. I'd lose all my friends. My mental health would go way downhill and I would never have finished grad school. Um, okay, so, uh, so let, stepping back, you know, what, what, this was exciting. It got perplexity gains, fewer parameters, kind of an interesting idea. I don't think this, it didn't really catch on. It didn't become mainstream yet. Um, but it was interesting. It got people's attention. I think one of the things that bothered people was like, there's no, this model seems wrong, right? It doesn't even, it doesn't know, like the words in the history are all just treated as like these elements of a set. There's no notion of like farther or closer. There's no notion, uh, like all of that has to be learned. It's probably learnable that like you should, when you're, when you're estimating the probability of the next word, you should probably spend, you, you know, use more of the information from the recent words. All of that had to be kind of learned, but you had a different matrix for each one. So I don't know, maybe it's okay. The hyperparameters have no intuitive interpretation at all. At least with the engram model, larger n was like, oh, I'm looking farther back into the past. We can all, we can all understand that. What does it mean to change the value of h, that like hidden dimension in the matrices? You know, more capacity, that's about all we can say about it has nothing to do with language. It's just about like a richer function class. Um, you can't interpret any parameters. Uh, the architectures, I, again, I don't find this intuitive. If you, if you gaze at this equation, where did it go? If you look at this and you see something, send me an email. I would love to know. Um, Uh, and, uh, but it, but, it, you know, perplexity reduced, it got people's attention. I think, I think it, you know, there was continued work, uh, in the space as a result of this. Um, we're not going to cover everything, but, um, I did want to say a little bit about this. So, so one thing in the, in that era of word vector, of excitement about word vectors, a little bit later on, um, people did try to do some interpretation of word vectors. Um, you know, the, the, the one thing you'll see in some papers is people would take word vectors and like do dimensionality on redu reduction on them and then visualize in the two dimensions you can put on a page in a paper, they'd have plots and they'd show words being closer or farther. And it was, you know, it was kind of interesting. Uh, people have, have done things like take the, the norms of, of parts of the parameters in a network and help this tell us how important different history positions are or something like that. People have taken word embeddings and clustered them and tried to analyze dimensions. This was all, you know, it was, it, people, tr we tried, okay? And, and I think in the end, uh, we've just kind of accepted that uh, the parameters of these models are extremely hard to interpret. Um, okay, so here's, here's my, my take on the feedforward networks is that they're, they're very similar to what we saw with the multinomial logistic regression approach, the kind of classification thing. It's just like more layers and harder to understand like this larger, fluffier cat, but it's still a cat, okay? Um, this, you know, we had the kitten before. It's like, this is just a bigger cat. Questions? I don't think, I think I'll say it more, more um, explicitly. I don't think the leap from older models, pre-neural pre models to neural models is all that big. Right, the principle of estimating the parameters is the same. Uh, there's the word, there's the word embedding thing, which is a which is a cool idea. Uh, but then everything after that, it just sort of follows from the same principles. 
you're still using the same data, you're still evaluating with perplexity. Um, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a huge intellectual shift. You have to get used to not understanding things very well. Okay. Um, so this is fine if, if we only ever care about modeling inputs that are bounded in length. So we're willing to make an engram assumption and forget about distant history. Uh, but that's, as we've said, that's not how language works. Nobody thinks that's how language works. And uh, there's nothing really special about absolute or let's say relative positions to the current position we're trying to predict. There's nothing, there's no reason we should learn a matrix for uh, the word four positions back. Or, you know, if we were scaling to really long sequences, um, like we want to model books, we wouldn't really want to have a, a vector or a matrix tied to the position uh, 974 words back from where I am right now. That's crazy, right? This just doesn't make any sense. Um, so, so also, but also this kind of model doesn't really capture the way words tend to combine locally with their neighbors to form bigger meanings. There's no, there's no compositionality here. Um, so basically what people started pushing towards is different ways of reusing the same parameters in a model to encode sequences of arbitrary length. And we're going to see a few different ways to do that. And if you've, if you've studied machine learning uh, or, or computer vision, you've, some of these things you will have seen before. Um, the, the next one I'm going to cover is convolutional networks. And uh, my, my friends who do research in NLP might find this strange because this really never took off. Um, but I think it's a nice stepping stone. And it, 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 it lets us get past the engram assumption. OK, so here. Uh, we, we, we no longer assume that we only care about the most recent n minus one words. We take the entire history going back to word one. And, uh, and this is, I mean, this is, again, it won't be, I don't think it'll be particularly intuitive, but it's mathematically quite simple. We start by defining a matrix uh, that is just stacking up the word vectors of the entire history up through the position before me. And what we're going to do at each layer of the network is define a new matrix. So this is X0. It's the bottom. Uh, XL will be the elf layer. And the way we do this is we apply this convolution function to the matrix at the previous layer. Um, and so you can think about the, the, the vector, one of the vectors in this, new, in this uh, intermediate matrix as like a hidden state representation of the mth history word at the elf layer. So we're going to do this iterative transformation that looks something like this. It's kind of like a feed. It's, it's not so different from a feed forward uh, transformation. There's affine uh, and then something nonlinear F, which could be like 10 H or something like that. Um, and the interesting part, OK, is where you look, what goes in to calculate uh, the M words vector in the new layer, uh, how far to the left and the right you, you look. And basically, this is a choice uh, how sort of how wide is the window? So this is W. This is telling me how far uh, uh, in the past I can look at a given layer. Um, and we can have multiple filters. We can have a different nonlinearity. The, 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 these are like hyperparameter decisions. Again, not particularly interesting. I think the visualization helps. Uh, we start with our, our word vectors. Let's say we're going to have a window size of three. So in order to calculate the representation of the first word in the next layer, we're going to look at these first three words, and we're going to multiply each of them by three different matrices and get new values. And then we move forward one, and we do the same thing for the next word position, and the same thing at each position, moving along until we get to the end. OK, so each of these guys is, is one of our filters. We could have more or less of them, uh, giving ourselves more or less parameters, giving ourselves more or less capacity. Um, at the end, at the very top layer, what we have is this matrix, which is as long as our history. And so somehow we have to, we have to transform this into something that's the right dimensionality. What we really want is a vector with V dimensions that we can push through a softmax and turn into a, uh, a distribution over the next word. Um, so what we do is something called pooling um, to get a, a fixed, uh, fixed size vector at the end. Usually, this is taking an element-wise max or an average. Uh, and then finally, we pass whatever comes out of that for a soft max. Not particularly intuitive, but it has this cool sliding window property. 
Um, if you drew the computation graph for this, which I don't think I, I don't think I did, you actually find that as you get more layers, you're looking a little bit farther back, right? Because you're you're you can draw a dependency back from this position here to the three the three previous in the last round and the three previous in the in the round before that, and so on. So the deeper this gets, the more the farther back in the history you can look. But it's still it's still finding. Um, but I don't know what what should bother you about this is that. This is just calculating the distribution for the next word, one next word, and you're looking at the entire history all the way back to the beginning. There's something I'm hoping you noticed. Let's imagine that we are now, uh, we're now going to encode the history of word XT, and then we move on to the next word XT plus one. Do you see a trick? Do you see a way to make training efficient that wouldn't have been available before for the feed forward network? I'm hoping that you do. Say it again. Parallelization, maybe. That's not what I'm looking for, though. Yep, that's right. So if I go back to my picture, this is suppose this is what I do for word T. When I move to word T plus one, all I'm doing is adding one more vector here. And I need to calculate one more vector here and one more vector at each, at each layer. I don't have to recompute everything else. I can just reuse it. So it is fixed computation at each time step. And that's really important, right? You might be able to parallelize it. I, I, it depends uh, on your hardware. It depends on uh, how you train. Um, I, I, I feel like the idea of trying to train a ConvNet with modern hardware on the kinds of data sets we train transformer models on today. That I hear that idea here and there. Somebody's probably tried it. I haven't seen it. it it's an interesting thought. Um, these originated in computer vision. They were really designed for processing images. Uh, similar ideas showed up in speech recognition. Um, in fact, I think there are speech people who claim it happened there first. I don't know. Um, uh, they, they, they popped up in NLP. I think the canonical reference is 2014 Kim. Um, they, they were used a little bit in language modeling. It never really took off. Uh, I, think, I think if you really were committed to this, you probably could do some interesting things with ConNet language models. One trick that, um, that you can do is you can use longer strides at deeper levels so you can skip over some of the words. And like what you're doing as you go, as you go deeper, you're basically blending information from more and more words. And so it may be fine to skip over more of them and have like longer steps, less computation, lo but longer dependencies among the words as you go deeper. Interesting idea. I haven't, I haven't really seen this done to death uh, for ConvNets. Um, but there you go. Uh, the ConvNet designed for speed, um, a, borrow, a borrowed idea from computer vision, a perfectly reasonable, no, no less reasonable than the feed forward net. And it gives you maybe a nice way to uh, expand the, the history that you're looking at without blowing up the number of parameters, which is what you'd have to do with everything we saw up till now. Does it make sense? Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I, I don't think I made that connection, but I believe it. Yeah, that might be right. Cool. All right. I mean, yeah, I, I, that it's like, this is one of these things in the research world that looks really cool. And I just don't know. Like, do you think they're going to? No. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll see. I like to be optimistic. Um, They're fixed. Yeah. Okay. I should add in. A, I should. I should go reread that paper and make the connection and add it to the talk. Um. Okay. So let's talk about recurrent neural nets. So this is also recurrent neural nets are, are older than language modeling. Uh, they they go back to the nineties. Uh, I think twenty ten was the time when we started seeing them getting used for language models, and they these really did. Unlike ConvNets, these were very widely used. People got very, very into RNNs. Um, 
And I'm not going to tell you everything about RNNs. I'm going to give you kind of the high level idea. Uh, and, and maybe we'll get some intuitions here. I'm going to start with the simplest. Actually, I'm only going to talk about the simplest RNN. Um, you get the whole history, just like we did with the ComNet. There's no Markov assumption. You map that history to the word, to the sequence of word vectors. And then the history is going to be encoded very explicitly in a fixed length state vector. So how do we get the state vector? Well, at the very beginning, at the left edge, before we start seeing words, the state vector is zero. That's the bottom of the recurrence. At every position after that, we calculate the state vector by taking first the word vector at that position, transform it linearly. Also, the state vector from the previous position, transform it linearly, and then some more, you know, some bias. This is going to give you uh, uh, a, an object which you then pass through a sigmoid. That's your nonlinearity. Uh, sigmoid is another squashing function that pushes values into the zero one range. Um, when I want to take, when I want to actually get the distribution over the next word, I take the state vector from the previous time step, transform it linearly, pass it through the softmax, and this gives me my distribution over the next word, which I, it's, it's just a vector y, which sums to one, and I can interpret it as a distribution. Um, so the recurrence here, the important bit is that you're using the state vector you calculated at the pre previous time step to get the new one, along with the current word. Um, the depth of the network, where is the depth? Well, in this version, the only way I'm getting depth is this sort of recurrence, the repeated, uh, the repeated application of this linear and nonlinear transformation. Uh, I'm recalculating a new state vector at each iteration. The longer the sequence is, the deeper my network is. I think I now have a picture of that. Right? So this is one layer, right? I pass my, I, I get my word vectors. Uh, I pass them, I pass that one word vector of the, the most recent word through linear, sigmoid, retransform, get a softmax, get the distribution over the next word. Here's my S. I have to reuse this S at the next time step. So if I unroll this over many time steps, I see that the farther down the sequence I am, the deeper the network, the more layers. But everything is getting compressed into a single fixed length vector at, at each time step. This is fascinating. You know, people had all kinds of thoughts about how this might relate to human language processing. People had, linguists had a lot of negative reactions to this idea that everything you needed could be encoded in a fixed length. I don't know, lots of discussion. Um, one of the problems with this kind of model, as I've shown it, is something called vanishing gradients, which I think you already know about because uh, somebody shouted it out as an answer to one of Sarah's questions. Um, basically, as you go to the distant past, the gradients tend to go to zero, makes it much harder to propagate error and learn the associations between things in the distant past and the future. So the capacity is maybe there, but it's very hard to get the signal. Um, the state also tends to change a lot on each iteration. The model tends to forget. And so people came up with variants. Uh, I think the most important ones are probably these down here, where you use something called long short-term memory, um, gated recurrent units invented by, uh, by my teaching colleague, Kim Kim Cho, who's teaching tomorrow. Um, tons, of, tons of cool ideas about improving the nature of that recurrence to help information flow more readily through the network. And of course, the other thing people did was stack these functions to make the network deeper in, in another way, not just through the history, but have more, more layers of processing at each word before you get to the distribution. Um, so stacked LSTMs, maybe two or three layers deep, became just an incredibly widespread solution in NLP. They became a very strong language model. Um, I don't know, Tiger? Um, I think, you know, I think, I think this was, this was really, it was really the LSTM approach that uh, signaled the change in, in all across NLP, not just language modeling, to using neural nets as the, the go-to solution. As long as you had enough data, this was the, the strongest thing to do. Um, and, you know, there were, there were and still are problems at the margins where the data limitations mean that we don't use these kinds of techniques. Um, but I think this was really the point where there was no going back and, um, you know, people like me who, who, who kind of, I was an omnivore when it came to models. I worked with a lot of different kinds of models. It was like, well, if we want things to work as well as they can work. We're probably going to incorporate LSTMs or some kind of neural net. 
And so this, I don't know, I would say what 2015 up until definitely, definitely before 2015, up until the transformer, this was just everywhere. Like you couldn't find papers and very few papers in NLP didn't have some kind of uh, recurrent neural net. Okay, so this is a, this is our, our sort of progression. Uh, we, we, we see, we can trace back the ideas in recurrent nets and con nets back to simpler things that were closer to the engram models. Um, again, you know, I haven't had to teach you how to do the training uh, for each of these. It's all the same, especially now that we have, uh, we have libraries and platforms that, that automate all of this stuff for us. Um, and so this is, you know, this is not the end of the story, of course. Um, None of these, it's interesting to me that none of these were really designed, all of these techniques, they, they were borrowed from other problems in machine learning. Uh, none of them are particularly designed to be language savvy, but I think they increasingly do a better job of, of baking in assumptions about the data uh, or giving us function classes that are amenable to learning about language in particular. They get better at handling sequences. They're, they're just like the recurrent neural net feels closer to what you want uh, out of a sequence model. Um, but they're also getting more expensive. And even with uh, even in the LSTM times, people complained about the computational expense of building the models. Um, the last model, of course, is the transformer. I, I shouldn't say it's the last model. It's the next model. Um, there will probably be things that come after it. But version four of the transformer, I'm not going to teach it to you. Uh, it was introduced in 2017. You'll hear about it tomorrow. Um, and I think Professor Cho will give you a nice bridge uh, from what we've seen here to, uh, to the transformer. Um, I want to spend some time on some variations on this language modeling idea uh, that will that will make a few more connections for you. Uh, and so, so one big one is called sequence to sequence. So, so far, I basically presented all of this as you have one sequence, you have a history, and now you're predicting the next uh, element of that sequence. Uh, and so if you're doing autocomplete and the, there's there's not really a fundamental difference between the things coming in uh, that you're using to predict and the next one, um, then, then it all makes sense. But if you have a different kind of input, then we might need a different kind of model. So uh, sequence to sequence models emerged when we were thinking about problems where there's a, a sort of separate random variable Y. So you see X and you're, you're trying to map it into Y. And the canonical problem here is machine translation. The driving application here has, has, has been machine translation for a number of years. Um, and so the, this family of approaches was developed for that, and that, most of my examples will focus on that case, but it, it can be used for many other things. Um, so what's, I don't know, let's go back to this, uh, this evaluation question first, because I think, you know, whenever, as I said early in the lecture, whenever you introduce a new problem, you should talk about how you're gonna evaluate it. Um, so the intuition when you do uh, uh, machine translation is you want, you have an input sequence in some language, let's say Chinese, uh, and you want to translate it, let's say into English, um, uh, you, want, you want that output to be fluent English and you want it to have the same meaning as the input. So that's called faithfulness or fidelity. Um, people used to uh, think of this as fundamentally a human evaluation problem. Um, early machine translation systems were, were, were expensive to evaluate because you had to get people. Often you would have people who spoke both languages and they would evaluate the faithfulness to the original meaning. Um, if, you had, uh, if you had a human translation of your test data, then you, you might not need a bilingual speaker. You could have them compare the faithfulness of the system output to the true output. Um, and you'd also have them judge the fluency. Around 2002, people realized that uh, the field would probably move a lot faster if we could automate that kind of evaluation. And so they introduced a very simple thing called the blue score, which takes one or more human generated references and the system output and essentially calculates a kind of n-gram precision. And, and you average this across a lot of examples and you get you kind of a rough idea of how well the machine translation systems output matches what humans should do. Um, and so Blue took over. I actually had a very personal experience with Blue. Uh, I was a grad student. I thought I was going to do a PhD in machine translation. I was very excited about machine translation. And then the Blue score came out, and I hated it. It feels wrong, right? I mean, language is so much more than, you know, there are many ways to translate a thing. And uh, if you don't use the right engrams, you might still do a really good job. It's also possible you could be really close in engrams and do really bad. I could imagine all these cases where blue was going to go wrong. 
And, you know, it basically didn't matter. People latched onto it. It was too good not to use. And I think, it, it, you know, in retrospect, I think I was a little, I, I had too strong an opinion. Um, it really did drive the field forward. It gave, it, it made it a lot easier to make progress. Um, but I, you know, I think, I think what we know today is that um, one, these metrics can be useful, but we should always reevaluate them. Like, like there should be room to improve the metrics as well as improving the systems. And it's valid research to try and come up with better things. And today we have better things than blue. And yet, yet people still report blue scores, right? So it's, these things become sticky. We get, we get, I'm just like, we just kind of latch on and we can't, we can't let them go. Um, so I, I would say it's always good to do human evaluations if you can, uh, especially if you're building you know, a system you're going to deploy. Uh, it's always good to look for new problems that are not captured by the automatic metrics. Um, but in any case, this is sort of the, the status quo is blue and its successors are used usually to automatically evaluate translation quality. So let's talk about how we solve it. Um, there's this, this problem is, oh my gosh, 1947. So almost 70 years, people have been thinking about using machines to automatically translate between languages. The driving use case, of course, back in, in the early days, it was the Cold War. And, uh, and they, you know, they were really excited about cryptography and had played a key role in, in winning World War II. Um, so there's this guy, Warren Weaver. Have you heard of Warren Weaver? He's an early information theory researcher. Uh, one naturally wonders if the problem of translation could be conceivably treated as a problem in cryptography. When I look at an article in Russian, I say, okay, this is kind of offensive. This is really written in English, but it has been coded in some strange symbols. I will now proceed to decode. So what he's saying is that what happened was the Russian speaker was actually thinking in English, as we all do had the thoughts in English, and then they got garbled up and came out through this weird Russian speaking apparatus as Russian. All we have to do is figure out how to decode it back into the original English. I don't think anybody really believed that story, but it's a cool, it's kind of a nice story. And for a long time, this was how we thought about the translation problem. Um, the same was used in speech recognition and, and some other problems as well. Um, so the pattern is called the noisy channel model. And we, we basically break our model into two components. The first one is the source, which models the generation of Y, the output we want. And then the channel model models the, trans the random transformation of Y into what we observe, X. So here, again, Y is the, the true message or the plain text, the missing information, the MT system output. And it's counterintuitive. Y comes first. Then... It gets garbled through a channel, a noisy channel, into the ciphertext or the garbled message, the observable thing, the, the input, uh, the, the, the language, the input language text. And so what we do when we, do, when we translate is we decode. Literally, we seek the Y that is most probable given X. And we can do this using Bayes' rule. That's what we want, the highest probability Y. <laughs> but our model doesn't give us that. Our model gives us P of Y and P of X given Y. But if we, if we multiply those two things together and renormalize, that is, that is the same, right? This is Bayes' rule. Um, and we can ignore the denominator because it's constant with respect to Y. So what you really need to do is choose, uh, if you have a model of the channel, the garbling, and you have a model of the source, uh, what you wanna do is choose the Y that maximizes that product. This is, this is known as the decoding problem. Um, so in translation, what you're trying to do, this, this just fits perfectly into the, uh, into the translation problem uh, where you care about faithfulness to the input and you care about fluency. Those were the two axes along which we originally evaluated. Um, and so if we were mapping a French word sequence F into an English word sequence, what we would want to do is maximize faithfulness and fluency. So if we think of this as the log probability of the channel model, how likely was this French uh, sequence to come out of a channel model if E went in? And we think of the log, if we think of the fluency as the log probability from the language model, then, uh, then it gives us a fluency score. And what we're trying to do is maximize the, two, the sum of the two together or the product of the probabilities. Uh, and this was this sort of channel model approach was, uh, was widely 
widely used in, in, in translation. Uh, this model here was called, uh, the, the, I don't know, the translation model. This was the language model. Uh, research could proceed on the two of them separately, orthogonally, and they could be recombined. Um, when I mentioned the, 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 uh, the stupid back off model, that was basically a demonstration that making the source model or the language model much better uh, led to much better performance on translation. For the channel model, uh, where you're estimating the probability of F given E, you really need paired sequences. You need bitext or parallel text. So this is a, this is a really important driver uh, in progress on machine translation. Um, you have to have a lot of sequences uh, and to estimate this conditional distribution. Um, and so if you can if you can do this, and there were a lot of papers on different ways to do this that we won't get into today. Um, Pretty interesting topic, like the idea of, of modeling uh, one sequence given another under various assumptions. And the way people, the way people, the ways people did this are worth at least an hour. One of the most beautiful papers in NLP, in my in my opinion, is a thirty year old paper uh, on some a sequence of models called the IBM models for machine translation uh, by Brown et al. Um, let's just talk about the data. We don't have time for all that. Where do we get parallel data? This is hopeless without parallel data. How do we get pairs of sequences? Ask humans to translate, that's expensive. The Bible, yes, a lot of people used the Bible in the early days. Um, of course, the Bible, there's some problems with the Bible. Like, like the language is different, right? right? The things people talk about in the Bible are different than uh, the, the things people talk about in, in you know, that they want to trend news and bureaucratic texts. It's different. Um, imagine translating, you know, some bureaucratic document and it starts talking about who begat whom. You know, what, what are the sins? Um, might get you into trouble. Any, any other thoughts? Movie subtitles. Interesting idea. Yeah. So that's like, that's like people already did the work and we're just going to reuse it. Wikipedia, Wikipedia is tricky because it's usually not direct translations. Students, poor students. <laughs> European Parliament, actually the original, the original one that got used was the Canadian Parliament, which does everything in both English and everything that, that's said in, in the proceedings of the, the Canadian Parliament is recorded in English and French. Uh, if it's spoken in one, it's translated to the other. Uh, so that, that, and that was a digitized corpus fairly early on. And so people, that's why English French translation was widely studied at first. Uh, the later, the European parliament, when, it, when, it, when their proceedings became digitized, there are a few other bilingual governments around the world. There are a few news agencies that translate. Um, one project I worked on when I was young was trying to scrape the web for parallel text. Of course, now, if you did that, you'd have to worry that some of that parallel text would be automatically translated um, and maybe not good enough to, to train on. Um, but you know, it turns out that at least for some language pairs, parallel data is a natural byproduct of human social activities, and we can, we can use the data to build the models. Of course, if you train on parliamentary text, your model may not be so good at helping like a traveler, right? You're trying to get hotel recommendations or something like that, right? Always think about what kind of text it is. Language is used for so many different things the text that you actually have may not align with what you really need. So it, at the end of the day, it may be a good idea to hire some people and translate some text in the domain you want to work in um, and, and pay them a good wage because translation is hard. Um, okay, I could talk for a long time about uh, pre-neural MT, but we're, 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 we just don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to give it to you in one slide. Um, going back to, we had this quote from 1947, going back to the 1950s, uh, people developed a lot of interesting ways to think about the translation problem. A lot of it links back to formal automata and grammars, uh, things you would learn about in an advanced course on uh, theory of computation. Some of it uh, ties into linguistics, a lot of expert crafting of rules. Um, the computers, of course, at this time were not so powerful. And so the humans were doing a lot more of the work. Uh, a lot of this was tied to linguistic theories. The big change happened around 93 when people started using the noisy channel approach. 
and, and Brown et al. introduced some channel models based on bytext. This was complicated stuff, but for a lot of us, it was how we learned about statistical modeling was through this particular problem and those particular papers. The language model part had already been cracked by that point, right? You would use, you'd have your Ngram model, you'd train that on as much target language text as you could. That gave you fluency, and then you'd apply these fancy techniques to get uh, to get to um, uh, the to, to get the, the translation part, the the faithfulness part. Um, interestingly, there's a gap between when this was done. This was proprietary, closed model, no open implementation. You couldn't figure all the details out from the paper, especially the decoder. Uh, this was one of the first projects I got to work on. We did an open source implementation of some of those models. Automatic evaluation followed, and then there's an explosion in machine translation research because the computers are getting better, there's more and more data, and, uh, and the tools are there. Um, a couple of interesting things started happening in the early 2000s. Uh, it was becoming clear that this like word by word approach to translation was just not as good as it could be. It was missing out on a lot of contextual cues. Um, and so people, the two main ideas people were exploring next involved working with larger chunks of words called phrases. Uh, sometimes organized in a hierarchical way, but the idea was to learn from the data how to put together bigger pieces and predict them as larger chunks rather than single words. Uh, this was very successful. Uh, the other was to use try to go back to linguistics and try to use syntactic parse trees uh, of either the input language. If it was if you had a parser for the input, maybe you could parse it and then build the translation off of the tree, uh, or construct a tree for the output as you go and maybe that would give you better fluency or maybe build trees over both and there were many approaches to both of these uh, to all three of these um, this really in the end i think this really only worked well for chinese english where there was uh th there was enough parallelism in the syntax and a lot of specialized effort uh you can read some nice books and, and overview articles on on this period a lot of interesting ideas were pursued and then of course um neural nets came on the scene and this this, there were some older papers uh, you can find on uh, neural machine translation, but really the point when it started gathering a lot of interest was 2013, so now 10 years. And this, this, cor this corresponds to the use, uh, again, of recurrent neural nets. So you can find papers about alternatives. Of course, the transformer took over after a few years, uh, but the basic idea was built on neural nets, on, on recurrent neural nets. I'm going to explain the RNN approach to sequence to sequence translation um, at a high level. Notice that the, the terminology here shifts a little bit. So we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about things using encoder and decoder, but it's different than in the noisy channel pattern. So, so just sort of reset on those, reset the vectors for those words. The high level model does not use the noisy channel at all. It just goes directly from F to E. So you're, you're building a distribution over the English sequences given the French, and the way you do that is you encode the French. And then you build essentially a language model over the English. So you're gonna generate the English words one by one, just like we, just like a language model. There's just now something else you have to condition on. Okay, so there's not gonna be a lot of surprises here. The encoding of that source sentence is gonna be a deterministic function of the words in that sentence. It's going to use a neural net. So let's talk about the encoding. We don't have to predict anything here. We don't have to go left to right. Um, it's convenient to do so because sequence, sequence modeling tends to be done that way. But essentially the idea uh, for the encoding is you do the, you do the word vector lookups for the input. Here it's German, F is German now. Um, and then you pass those through maybe a forward neural net, a forward recurrent net. And then maybe you take, you, you also pass it through a backward neural net, why not? Uh, and then you can concatenate those two. This, this kind of bi-directional approach was very popular anytime you didn't actually have to predict the words. Uh, all you have to do is encode them. And it's nice because on the left, you're getting, uh, the orange is giving you the left context uh, and kind of accumulating information about each word based on what happens on, the, on one side. The, the backward RNN going, the green going from the right to the left is giving you information from the other side. After however many layers of this, you end up with an encoding, you can concatenate for each word, it's left and it's right, right side encoding. Um, and then, you know, then it basically looks like a recurrent 
neural net language model. Um, the, the, the difference is that you now have this extra context, this thing from the encoding, and you have some function for deciding what to access from that context, which I'm not going to talk about. Okay, just, just think of this as more neural net stuff that, that takes a, uh, an arbitrary length encoding, a matrix of the input, and chooses what to use in some way uh, to, to, to pass into the recurrent neural net. And everything else here essentially looks the same. You've got, uh, you've got some probably softmax function that takes the state to give you the dis distribution over the next word. Um, and just remember, you know, all of this is, has parameters. Uh, everything is differentiable. There's you know, different ways you could design these, but it all boils down at the end of the day to some alternation between linear and nonlinear functions being applied in alternation. Um, this access function, I'll let the cat out of the bag. The, the thing that, that was found to work really nicely here was the first version of attention, which you will learn about tomorrow. Um, and basically what this, is, what this does is it generalizes that neural language model we discussed earlier, the, the RNN model. It just adds this extra context from the encoding of the input sentence, right? So I could have taught this in the other direction. I could have done the machine translation thing and then said, oh, language modeling is a special case where there's no input, right? Um, so, right, so, so if you take the log probabilities of each uh, of, of the, the whole sequence of words, uh, this is what you're going to optimize when you train uh, your neural net. Uh, so the, the term that got used here was end-to-end -end training, um, which was in sharp contrast to the earlier machine translation approaches where there were often lots of little modules that had to be built uh, using you know, different techniques for each part of your uh, language model, your translation model, all these pieces. End to end was very exciting. It's like you know, the sausage, the, the pigs go in, the sausage comes out. I don't have to think about anything in the middle. It's all just the same old tools. Um, the part nobody ever, even going back to the pre-neural stuff, the, 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 um, the Brown models from IBM 30 years ago. The part nobody ever talks about is decoding. Um, you have to, at the end, you have to search for a high, high scoring sequence. And I want to talk a little bit more about that because I think it often gets glossed over and it's, it's an important thing to understand if you want to build this kind of model. Um, so yeah, actually, before I show you that, um, it really was frustrating when, when I was a student and we wanted to re-implement those models and we realized they never actually published the decoding algorithm. Like this beautiful paper, one of the best papers in NLP, they got so fixated on the learning, they got so excited about how to build the model, they never talked about how you put it into practice and turned it into a working system. There was no paper. Like, like people who had been at IBM at the time we're calling these guys up. They, uh, by the way, after they published that paper, they went to Wall Street and, uh, and did a hedge fund and they made a ton of money and they kind of disappeared from the field. And like some of the people who knew them or were friendly with them were still calling them on the phone, like CEO of a hedge fund. Hey, you did this thing. How do you decode? They didn't remember, shockingly. Um, the code wasn't, you know, like, like nobody knew. We had, to, we had to like reconstruct it. There were a lot of papers. Uh, there was one paper that showed that doing it exactly was NP hard, which was really, you know, I guess we're not afraid of that anymore, but that was like disheartening to realize this is just a really hard problem. So I want to talk a little bit about decoding. This is the last technical thing I'll cover. Um, I know this is a lot. It's a relatively simple algorithm um, and it lends itself to all kinds of twists and turns and tricks. And I think, you know, it's, it's good to remember that at the end of the day, when you do translation or you build a chat GPT like application and it takes a language model and predicts a sequence, there's going to be some kind of discrete search. Everything is not going to be SGD. And so I think seeing some basic ways to start thinking about the discrete search you're going to need, it's useful. One day you'll thank me, I hope. Okay, so here's beam search for, for seek to seek models. Um, notice that I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk a lot about the modeling quantities. The most important thing is the scoring function which is usually for us going to be the log probability over next possible words, given the history and the encoding of the input. So when you see score, that's what that is. Okay, it's the log, it's the log probability of, an, of a candidate next word in the context. Okay, so we start off, we're going to keep this data structure called the beam, and it's indexed by a position. So at the very beginning, at position zero, 
the beam has one thing on it. It's uh, it's a zero, but that's the that's the score, and it's just the start symbol to say we're about to get ready. We're going to get going. We have not accumulated any log probability yet. Everything is possible. Bright sunny new day. Um, we're going to keep a data structure called f, which is the set, and it's also indexed by zero, by by an integer. Uh, and this is the set of finished hypotheses up to this length. Okay. Um, and then we're going to have uh, we're going to have a max length m. So we start off uh, with uh, t um, at uh, at one, and then we're just going to increase it every round. So at each round, we're going to consider sequences of longer and longer length. We start off by setting making a hypothesis list for this length t. It starts off empty. We copy over all of the finished completed hypotheses that we have up to this from the previous round up to this point. Uh, we're going to make the beam empty to start off. And then we essentially consider every possible thing from the beam from the previous round. So this, these are all T minus one length sequences. S is the score. Y is the sequence up till now. So this is a, a length T minus one sequence. And we consider every possible vocabulary item we can continue with. All the options are on the table. And we throw, we, we, we add S to the score. Sorry, we add the score of this next word V given the context to S. We concatenate V to Y and we put this in as a hypothesis H. How many of them will we have? Well, we'll have K of them from the beam from the previous round times V vocabulary words. This is too many. We're not going to keep them all. Most of these are terrible. We're only going to keep K of them for this round. And what we do is we take the top, the top scoring one. So we iteratively pop off the highest scoring hypothesis from H. It's a score uh, together with a T length sequence. Uh, if Y doesn't end in the stop symbol, then add this to the beam. We could continue this. This is a hypothesis to take on to the next round. If it does in the, in the stop symbol, then put it into the completed, the set of completed hypotheses, F at length T. Uh, and if we if we hit the point where um, uh, there are more than k finished hypotheses uh, in in f at position t, then we re we return the max scoring one. Or if we want more than more, we can return the max scoring few. And so we basically keep going. We, this algorithm will run. The only stopping criterion is that f has gotten uh, at least k hypotheses uh, that are completed. As soon as you finished k with a stop symbol. You now have enough, and you feel confident that the one you've chosen is a, is a good choice. The larger k is, the longer the runtime will be. If you drive k up to infinity, then you're doing exhaustive search. With any finite k, this, this algorithm has no guarantee that it will give you the best scoring sequence. Um, and that's actually something we've become very comfortable with. It's an approximate search. There are even papers arguing that uh, this kind of algorithm, while it doesn't exactly optimize the score from the model, it optimizes that score with a combination of something else that's helpful. And so doing beam search may actually be better than doing the, the too expensive exhaustive search. Does it make sense? Do you have questions? I don't usually like showing like a procedure and walking through it. Um, maybe it would be better if I animated it. I didn't have time for that. But I think, uh, I think having a basic intuition for how this works, it's not mysterious. It's also not a neural net. Um, there's, there's a little bit more going on. Of course, if you set if you set the beam size to one, this becomes extremely simple. You're just greedily choosing the next word at each round, which sometimes people do. Sometimes people do the, the totally greedy decoding. Questions? Yeah. That's a great question. When you're evaluating the model, should you set you should you think of these things like the beam size, the maximum length, should you think of those as hyperparameters and optimize them on the validation set? You could. I think another another smart thing to do is to try different is to do sensitivity analysis. Change k and see how performance changes as you change the beam width. You know, sometimes people get very excited when they see that a small beam works really well. And like, it's worth knowing, right? Would I get a lot better or would it start to hurt me if I did a, a wider, more expensive search? 
Uh, but you could also, if you were doing a deployed system, you'd probably want to think about optimizing both the accuracy and the cost, right? Bigger, bigger, you're going to have a longer, it's going to take you longer to do the search if you increase the beam size. That's often one of the main factors. Great question. Okay, I think I have just a, oh, that's the wrong laptop. I think I have just a couple more points. So uh, beam search runtime will depend on the beam width, the vocabulary size, that's very important. Um, also the maximum output length. Uh, if you set K equal to one, it's greedy left to right. If you increase the K and M to infinity, then you, you're basically moving towards brute force exhaustive search. It might be worth, worth increasing them a lot just to see if the beam, if the approximations in the beam search are hurting you, hurting your performance, like maybe you have a really good model, but the search is, uh, is, is hurting. No guarantees. This is, you know, like many things in NLP these days, uh, we wish we had exact algorithms. There are probably some people working on that or working on some kind of guarantees, uh, but, but, you know, somewhat sort of vaguely greedy approaches are often what we use in practice. Um, there are there are all kinds of variations on this. People do they add randomness in? They have different ways of pruning uh, to change the search criteria a bit. There's something called patience. We explored in a recent paper. There's a lot of variations on this. If you understand the basics, there's a whole literature of search techniques. And I think one of the things I don't talk about here is adding constraints. So you know people are very worried about language models and what they produce and whether the output is true or whether it's respectful or has other properties changing the search algorithm may be one of the one of the best tools for helping to make sure that language models behave in ways we want them to behave i'm not going to say that's the only way but i think it's i think it's underappreciated as uh, an option for altering uh performance um yeah so i want to make this point about data uh this is just kind of an aside uh, as we close um so for 30 years, we've been recognizing and saying that more data is better and we have more data. There are more people, more of them are on the internet. More of that data can be scraped and used to train a language model or a translation system. First, it was the web, then the social web, more and more data. It's more diverse. There are more languages on the internet at, at, at higher rates than there ever were before. The data sets have become so large that they're unmanageable, right? And this is, pro I, on the whole, I think it's a good problem to have. Uh, if we do it right, we can have more voices contributing to the technology, we can include more languages, we can include more variations on language, and we should be able to get better performance in a lot more scenarios. More people can participate. That's good. Um, but you know what we've been seeing nowadays, people are doing things with language models that we never would have considered back in, in the engram days. Like if you sample from an engram model or ask it to continue a prompt, it's just going to be random stuff. It's not, you know, it might look kind of like the language, but it's not, it's not going to be very coherent. And what we've seen is that these more powerful models are often able to continue prompts in ways that are very, very interesting and surprising. Like they answer questions, they, uh, they perform tasks, they generate code, they do all kinds of cool things we were not expecting. And so this move towards neural language model as just a way to generate has opened up all kinds of questions about what we train them on and what gets learned. They're very good at learning and they pick up things uh, that maybe we don't want them to repeat like cultural biases or you know, if you train your model on some nasty portions of the internet, you're gonna get the model saying things that are deeply offensive. We, we, we and many others have found that it's incredibly easy to get language models to say nasty things from innocuous prompts. So if we're worried about the quality of data, whatever that means, that's a tricky concept too. Uh, or fairness, that's also a tricky concept, or we're worried about privacy, uh, or we don't want the models to pick up cultural biases or all the cultural biases, then we have, a, we have to think a lot harder about the data that goes in. And we have to do more, we have to, do more to, to uh, make smart decisions about what we train the models on because they generalize in, in just crazy ways. Um, okay, I wanna close with this slide. Um, a lot of what we've seen over the past 30 years is this. Increasing model capacity, which makes models more expensive. You can't train, unless there's a billionaire sitting in the room, you can't train a modern language model on your own. That's a worry, right? So, so this increased computational cost, that's a, real, that's a real issue. 
Also, the increase in training data. We've been seeing a lot. We, this, is, this is a major trend of the past 30 years. Possibly, I, I kind of speculate, this is actually maybe more important than the fancy models you're going to learn about uh, today, today and tomorrow, the LSTM followed by the, the transformer. Those the details of those models may be less important than the amount of data we're able to train on now and what kind of data it is. This is the part that doesn't get talked about enough, ways of improving inductive bias. You can find examples in the literature. One, one case with the, the transformer, just to foreshadow, you'll learn about the transformer tomorrow. Positional embeddings were introduced to encode where in a sequence each word is. One way of making transformers work better and generalize better is to use better positional embeddings. Um, this doesn't, it's never completely gone away. People always forget about it. If you can improve the inductive bias of a model, you may be able to get better generalization with less data. It may also be the case that uh, improving the quality of the data or the diversity of the data or just deduplicating the data may also, may also have some benefits. But all of this is like, this is still sort of like an abstract goal. What we really want at the end of the day is one of these things probably, right? So this is why I always start when I talk about NLP tasks. How do we evaluate the application? How do we know whether the thing we built works? Uh, I think, you know, just to comment a little bit, we're, we're in a bit of a crisis around this right now. Many, many, many benchmarks exist for NLP systems. And we were happily chugging along, making better and better systems on many of these benchmarks for a long time. And then less than a year ago, this new system, this new product was launched, ChatGPT, that put NLP technology in the hands of more people than ever before. And shockingly, we found that the things people want to use ChatGPT for don't look anything like our benchmarks. OK, now you, you laugh. You're young. Imagine you've spent 25 years doing research in this field. It's invigorating. Like, hey, we have to rethink this. We have to rethink how we evaluate. Don't forget about this. This question of how we know what works better, it's not test set perplexity. That's a proxy. Often it correlates, but there's no guarantee. This is the thing you should really be, be, be excited about if you, if you want to build NLP applications. And then there's this other thing, like how do we know whether we advance knowledge? That's probably out of scope for most of the summer school. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's worth keeping in mind that there's always been this tight connection between the things we can engineer to do NLP and deeper questions about how language works, how people use language. Um, building computational simulations of these phenomena is, uh, is one of the ways we may be able to, to deepen our understanding of language and the social world it works in. Um, I think we're basically at time. Yep, everything else here is references. I'll make sure that the organizers have a copy of an up to date copy of my slides. We have a couple minutes. I'm happy to take more questions. There, there are some mics, they might be buzzy. I don't know. Oh boy, I see a hand in the back. In the most inconvenient place. You can shout. I'll repeat it. Um, are interested in better performance in applications, which means that the general like direction of research is all towards better performance in applications with no with like disregard for advancing knowledge, which sort of to me seems like a bit of a problem because um, we're not really uh, optimizing or trying to move towards benchmarks that are actually genuinely useful. They're just the benchmarks that are uh, useful in money making applications. So, so I think there's two things here. So the first thing I'd say is I would separate the benchmarks from the money-making things. I think everybody recognizes that the benchmarks are kind of, you know, they tend to be like abstract, convenient for researchers, versions of tasks that are relatively straightforward to evaluate. And, you know, it's now in very sharp relief, but even before ChatGPT, we knew that those weren't exactly the real problem, right? Doing well on the WMT machine translation benchmarks is not the same as making a useful translation system in the world. And everybody knew that already. That's, one, that's, the, that's the smaller point. The bigger point that I think you're making is um, 
there's there's now you know the 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 most powerful models are controlled by a small number of corporations that have a profit motive the and they're and they're way too expensive for the rest of us to build and that's why um and the worry that you seem to have is that uh this puts pressure for the research to go mainly in the direction of applications and less uh, in fundamental knowledge, and I would even I would even broadly say advancing knowledge includes knowledge about the models themselves, right? There's the science of, of what we do with language. There's also the science of studying the model artifacts and under like you know what are these things? What can they do? They are they are now objects in our world. We can study them using the scientific method. And I think you're right that um, that the, the the profit motive does tend to prioritize near term applications that can be built. Um, it tends to push people towards uh, shorter horizons and exploiting the things we have. And there's like, you know, there's kind of maybe an arms race among companies. I mean, I think my answer to this is one, I, you know, I, I try to be optimistic um, because first of all, this is always, this is not new. This has always been the case. People said, people said the same things about search engines. There, there came a point where you couldn't really do academic work on state-of-the-art search engines because Google's search engine is totally proprietary. People only had vague ideas. Unless you worked there, you didn't really know what was in it. Even if you did work there, you didn't know everything that was in it. Um, I think, you know, this is this is just sort of always been a thing with computer science. As soon as things become productized, you have sort of what's happening in the commercial world. And that's somewhat different from what we do in the research lab. I think, you know, it's better if if we have more understanding of what they're doing. It's better if things are more open, but they won't always be open. And we're now seeing a turn with language models towards more closed models. Some of us are pushing back, right? We think at, at AI2, we're building an open language model. Others are building open language models. Share more details about the data. Share more details about the experimentation. Um, I think that will help. I think another big bet I, 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 I really am ex very optimistic about, I don't think that the models we're using today are always going to be this expensive. I, don't, I think the state-of-the-art models are going to come down in price uh, because there's a lot of pressure to make these things more efficient and, uh, and, and you know, find alternatives that don't take months to train with, uh, with massive numbers of GPUs. Uh, I think a variety of forces will push us towards uh lower costs and you'll be able to do interesting things on on smaller hardware that's my hope um so keep you know if you need something to work on efficiency is a great thing to work on uh hello yeah hey <laughs> where yeah yeah so uh like a lot of the recent uh language models that are capable of performing good in this sequence to sequence task are a lot uh mostly like only decoder based models they don't have the encoder that takes in the encoding of the whole context so how are they do they work using just the decoder of the the entire structure i mean you know the short glib answer is we don't know um but i think you know the the fascinating thing about language modeling is people make this argument that like to be really good at language modeling you have to learn a lot of stuff about the world about the language, about I don't know um, the, the the topics that uh, that that people talk about, um, and so it's puzzling, right? That just continuing with a decoder only model, just continuing from a question prompt, you get an answer. Um, I think you know my skeptical tendency is to think this isn't magic, um, this isn't understanding. I don't really like that word. What it really is is that the model has seen so much data so much more data than any of us will ever see it has read you know it would say i think one of my engineers estimated that it would take 200 years of reading non-stop like no sleeping nothing else to read a to read a trillion tokens something like that and then that might even be off by an order of magnitude okay so like there is more data being read by these language models than you could read in your lifetime and you know what? Humans are just not that creative. So the question you asked looks like some other questions that it saw before. That's kind of my working hypothesis. Okay. That sounds glib and dismissive. I don't think you should take it that way. That's a very powerful thing to be able to do. Okay. I still think it's really cool. Um, even if it's quite different from the kind of intelligence we have. Um, but I think that's basically what's going on. It's seen when it works, when the language model prompted gives you what you want 
it's probably because what you asked it looks kind of like some other context it saw before. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I continue because I have the mic. Wave your hand. Hi. Okay, hi. Um, so, so my question is about uh, the evaluation part that you mentioned. Uh, what I'm, what I got from your presentation is that there's basically a kind of dilemma. On the one hand, um, we have these uh, benchmarks, and you talked about how people stick to them, and uh, rather than finding models that generalize uh, over the task that we actually want to achieve, they just generalize for the for this benchmark uh, as time goes on. And then you also mentioned uh, that we want to have maybe human ev evaluation. Uh, but of course, in practice, this is also costly. It requires uh, this its own biases, and it requires, you know, a lot of people to to do. And most research projects maybe not are not able to afford it, which is why they use the benchmarks. And um, so, where do you see this going in the next couple of years? My question. Yeah. Um, so I think you know I think automatic evaluation bench based benchmarks have spoiled us. Um, does anyone know a person who does? Field research in biology. Okay, it's not fun, right? It's like like my sister. My sister got her PhD recently in uh, a, a branch of field biology. Oh, my mic is not working. It's on. Okay, she had to go out and sit all day for months on end in a boat on the Panama Canal with mosquitoes in the hot sun to take video of birds, which she then had to go home and watch and annotate by hand. It's like very, this kind of work is, even with technology, it's very, 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 very tedious and high cost, okay? Um, and so I feel like, um, yeah, doing good evaluation might be costly. Like, I hope we can find ways to reduce that cost, but you have to do it right. One option I'm not okay with is just don't evaluate rigorously, which if you read some recent literature, I think some people would like to do. Um, and that was a that was a terrible phase in the, like I didn't even mention that phase of history and the history of NLP before we started doing rigorous evaluation. Um, like no human event, just like here's some examples. Look, anecdotes. Like this is this is not research. Okay, we can't go back to that. We absolutely can't. I completely agree. There are shortcomings with benchmarks. There are shortcomings with human evaluations. It's not trivial. We don't always know the right thing to ask the humans. I've written some papers about how human. You may not want to think of humans as being the gold standard. Um, so I think, you know, I, I guess I have uh, one thought, which is that I think the more precise you are about what you want to build, the better you can come, the, the more likely you are to come up with a good evaluation where you ask the actual user community of the thing you are building, how it works for them, and you're engaged with real humans. I think that can be better. I think these abstract problems. Uh, or these very, you know, claims of very general purpose uh, models, I think that puts us in a harder spot with, with respect to evaluation. Um, I also think, you know, we have to, we have to keep updating the benchmarks. Like that's, that's a thing people are reluctant to do. They get very attached to particular metrics, particular data sets. And we've learned that um, you can spend many years optimizing on things that just end up not mattering so much. So I think we have to, we have to, we, we had a paper called bi-dimensional leaderboards, and I really love this image. Um, on the one axis of a leaderboard, you have the, the different systems that are competing to do better. But then there can be another axis where you have different, different evaluations, different metrics. And we think about competition on this axis, but we can also think about competition on this axis. And if we have ways to, to sort of inspect and say, these align better with humans, or uh, these are more predictive of performance on something else we care about, um, then you can, be, kind of, you can have competition on both axes at the same time. And we can have, you know, these two forms of research can feed each other and they can both benefit. It's not trivial. This is, it's very, and it's not single dimensional either. I think that's an important point. Um, but I think, I think there's so much, we could be doing so much better than we are. And, we're now being forced to, to take this very seriously. Yeah. He can, he knows how to find me. Fair enough. Uh, it, um, it's sort of linking something you just said and and the answer to the previous question. Um, uh, it was interesting you you described you know generative text models as 
cool, but it's different from the sort of intelligence we expect from humans, and maybe that's still valuable. Um, I, I just wonder if there's a, a, a challenge somewhere in the communication and maybe linking back to the profit incentive of these companies that they're presented as if they are human intelligences. And some of those use cases that people expect from them are attributing a, a human-like intelligence, even just people asking chat GPT questions, which are actually better answered by a Google search yeah. and assuming it's doing one in the back end. And I, I, I don't know if you want to speak to yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think... Um... Let me say this in a diplomatic way. I think that there are design choices one can make about the end application that either work against or encourage human biases to anthropomorphize, right? So I think when you set the thing up as chat, when the interface feels, it looks like my phone when I text my friends, it, everything, everything about it is sort of set up to make me feel like I'm having a conversation with another person. I'm not sure I'm a fan of that design choice. Um, if we want to give an honest portrayal of what these things are, of course, you know, to be fair, we don't really know what these things are, right? Like people, you, you get all these debates between very smart people about whether it's intelligence, how it's same, how it's different, what it has, what it doesn't have. These are great questions for the research community. The public is not, you know, isn't doesn't have all the tools we have to talk about these things, and so I think I think the research community needs to think long and hard about what we should be saying to the public, and I think presenting these things as, oh, it's intelligence, it's like talking to another person, it's sentient or whatever, you know, whatever claims people make, I think it's kind of irresponsible, um, and I would I would prefer a much more toned down approach. Of course, the profit motive works against that, you know, what what can I do? Um, I, I would like to find ways to help the public, and maybe people here have good ideas about this. How do you help the public look at these and see them for what they are um, and not be misled? Because I, I actually think the biggest danger of these models is that people will trust them and believe they are doing things they are not really doing. And so, yeah, I, I would love to see more work on better interfaces. We're thinking about this hard. You know, We want to launch a demo of our own models at AI2. We don't want people to be misled by them. We, we want to encourage people to think about them as tools, the full capabilities of which are not well understood, the limitations of which are not yet well understood. So lots of, lots of things to be figured out. Okay, so I think we're over time. Sorry. Thanks for the questions. Thanks. So uh, let's all go to lunch. Remember, uh, for the next coffee break, it's going to be outside, okay? Not there. So today, the evening, we're going to enjoy the Lisbon weather. <laughs>